proceed, so I will call the meeting to order at uh, 631. Um, <clears throat> we uh, thank you all for being here, whoever is participating. Um, anyone who's joining remotely, we would ask that you change your name display to your first and last name on your screen so we know who's talking to us. And anyone who addresses the council, we would ask you again to rec to state your full name and where you live. Anyone who is uh, addressing the council, we would ask you to keep your comments to three minutes and Councillor Bate will uh, assist us with the timekeeping with the yellow card for one minute left and the red card for your time is up. And we can get started. First, I'd ask uh, Councillor Cohn to uh, indicate her appearance on the record since she's appearing remotely. Helene Cohn, District 2. Okay, thank you. All right. <clears throat> um, and we next have up to approve the agenda. Are there any uh, requested changes to the agenda? All right, we can move right along to general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on any item that is not on tonight's agenda. And as with our other uh, expectations, we would ask you to keep your comments to three minutes or less, and we will start with, uh, with people here in the room. John Snell. Thank you very much, Mayor. John Snell, live at 17 First Avenue. I'm here tonight uh, as a board member of the Farmer's Market. I'm I'm a, the customer representative on that board. And we found out on Monday that BGS, Buildings, Grounds, and Services, uh, has pulled the rug out from under us, returning to 133 State Street. They, in November, gave us the okay that we would be there. Uh, this was initially, they, they were saying it would be two years, so we felt grateful that we were going to be back in, uh, and it was a total shock. They listed three reasons that they might need to make uh, deliveries uh, on Saturday during the market of oil and other things that they... Um, I don't even know what the others were. I mean, There's it, something about uh, <clears throat> a generator a running. generator running, yeah. Which uh, I'm assuming if it complies with noise ordinances, we'll be fine. Uh, and then they have an electrical box, which I'm assuming will be secured no matter what. So we, we realized that, you know, with two months to go before the market opens up, we can't screw around and we're, we're poking sticks at a hornet's nest here uh, and trying to get as much public input uh, in as we are able to. Some people have asked, well, couldn't we just go back up the hill to Vermont College? And I'm sure we could have an invitation to do that. The, that location did not work for the farmers in a lot of ways, mainly loading in and out. And honestly, they probably lost half a million dollars of tourist business mm -hmm. uh, being up there because the tourists didn't show up. I would remind the council that um, in the 10 days we were at 133 State Street, we had almost 20,000 people attend the market in 10 days. Uh, we, over the whole market, we raised nearly uh, $1.2 million that kept that money locally. Uh, and of the, we did a poll of the 237 people we polled, 221 said that while they're at the market, they also shop elsewhere in town. So I am asking you to do whatever you can to support us being back at 133. I think letters, calls are, are, are vital. Like I said, we really have turned out the troops here. And, and I think even if, even if people get tired of hearing 133, that's what we need to do. Um, so any questions I can answer? One question I have is, I, I, <clears throat> I'll tell you, I already talked to, uh, I heard about this last night, I already agreed to send a, send a letter to the state on the 
uh, as mayor, and uh, <clears throat> I uh, wanted to get uh, get straight the uh, the person who I'm, who I'm writing to. It's Ed Pembroke, is that right? Yes, and, Eric you know, Pembroke. And what's his title? He, he's the director of BGS. Yes. Okay. Great. Anybody else? And like our signature yeah. on it to make it stronger. Um. Sure, if people can, Thank if you. I can get a letter into the uh, into City Hall tomorrow, and it, we we can have it so everyone can come in and sign it. Yeah, Lauren. Or maybe if we all just agree tonight, maybe you could just kind of write all of our names on it on behalf of City Council and the Mayor, and then we don't have to line up signatures and stuff, so we can get it in ASAP. Sure, I'll do that. Tim. Yeah, thinking if for some reason the 133 lot doesn't work, they have a number of substantial lots right in the immediate area. Is there a plan B? Well, they, thank you, Tim. Um, they did offer us Taylor Street again, and we flat out said no. It's it's windy, dusty, full of potholes. Uh, it's just not adequate to our, our needs. Okay. The other lots on that side behind the buildings also have the same sort of problems. 133 isn't perfect, but it's the best we got going. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Did they offer directly across the street from 133, like behind the? They they did that the last early last fall as an option. Yeah. No, it really it's just when you really look at how it's laid out, it just doesn't. It it won't fit. You've got a lot of uh, vendors there every week, right? Like we have, we'll have over 50 vendors there every week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jack, would you like a motion? That, or do we just all nod that we want you? You can just all give me the okay and I'll okay. just do it. Yeah. Okay. You're right on our behalf. Is that Great. Okay. And, well, and Lauren, did you have something else you wanted to say? Okay. I really appreciate that. Terry. May I suggest that the the commissioner of BGS also be included in this communication? Yeah. 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 We're actually asking uh, the Department of Agriculture to request a meeting with the governor, uh, figuring that that's the best, that, that it's, it's, it's in ag's interest to have us there. Um, but whatever works, we're happy to have it happen. And I would like, like to point out to people who are voting next week that all of you are eating your dinner here tonight. So anybody who thinks you don't work hard is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, John. Thanks for bringing this to our attention. We never would have known. All right. I don't see anyone else in the room who's interested in being recognized. Is there anyone participating remotely who'd like to be recognized? And I should should have mentioned earlier that the best way to ask to be recognized if you're participating remotely is to use the electronic raise hand feature on your uh, on your computer. And I'm not seeing anyone doing that, so we can move on to the consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? I'll make that motion. Is there a second? second. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. One thing we should say about the consent agenda. Okay. Uh, if you want to, but it seems I had a couple calls today about what the change in the city managers. Oh yes, I I can mention that. Thank uh, you. The uh, the city manager. Uh, we did the review of the city manager last week at our meeting and. Uh, and one of the one change we have is that the uh, because the city manager has a multi-year contract, it includes uh, an escalator based on the uh, CPI from year to year. And uh, people may recall that uh, the city manager and the directors of all the departments agreed this year to not take the uh, the salary increases that they would be entitled to. And so the amendment to the city manager's contract is to state that he is foregoing the uh, the increase that he would otherwise be entitled to. Thanks, Tim. Um, 
Next, yes. I mean, just on that, just I think all of us at council have expressed deep gratitude to the staff for doing that. I mean, this is our department heads that have been working so hard this year with the flood and, you know, consistently work hard. So just, just saying thank you. Um, and I, I know everyone shares that. And Yeah. People should recognize that this is not a token sacrifice that the department heads are making that uh, altogether it adds up to something like $50,000. So that was a significant, uh, <clears throat> significantly increased our ability to, retain something else that otherwise would have uh, would have gone uh, gone away if if they hadn't done that so I agree I totally really appreciate all the work that they've done and and their sacrifice in this regard Carrie yeah I want to echo that and to also stress that this wasn't something the city council came up with and demanded this was something that the staff came to us uh, offering and so I want to express my gratitude to that and Thank you for this was a way that everyone kind of recognized that this was a tough year and we all kind of had to pull together and pitch in a little bit. And um, I really appreciate that so much. So thank you. Okay. Time to move to the audit report. And as you're getting set up, um, we had a little bit of discussion at the very beginning of do we have to take any action or can we just hear the report? And I don't think that any action is actually required, but uh, we'll, uh, we got it yesterday or, or late Monday. There may be questions that people may have questions later, but uh, I figured it, would, it was worth getting it on the agenda tonight, tonight and hearing the report. Oh, no, he didn't talk to me. Oh. Hi, so I'm um, Sarah LaCroix, the finance director. I'm here with Miranda from RHR Smith & Company. Um, the firm who audited our financial statements for fiscal year 2023, and she's here to give that presentation. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Um, so the presentation I'm going to give is actually um, some excer ex excerpts from the audit that y'all were that was included in the present in the packet that y'all received. Um, I'll try to mention the page number as we look at the schedules, but if I forget, just remind me if you actually want to look at the schedules with me. Um, before we hop into it, I will say one of the biggest or the biggest question is what's the opinion? That can be found on page one in the letter from RHR Smith. And in our opinion, the accompanying financial statements um, present fairly in all material respects. Um, as you go through the audit, um, if you're not going to read all, I think, 100 pages or so, um, and it puts me to sleep, so I wouldn't blame you, but the management's discussion and analysis at the very beginning of the audit is a good synopsis of what has happened during the year. Um, there was economic factors. It also mentions debt and capital assets, and there's a comparison current year to prior year. So it's it's a good synopsis of what actually happened. And that can be found on page five of the audit. The first schedule I'm going to talk about is uh, the balance sheet for the governmental funds. Um, this can be found on page 17 of the audit. 
Um, this is the answers. The next big question that most people have is, what's our fund balance for general fund at the end of the year? Um, this is found in the first column as general fund down at the bottom. For FY23, you ended the year with about $1.8 million. Of this, 163,000 is non-spendable. It's already tied up and prepaid in inventory. Um, 153,000 is restricted. This is done by outside agencies, so they're restricted to how they can be spent. The committed fund balance of $549,000 um, is, is management, council, um, restrictions on some of those funds. A list of the committed fund balances is found in note 14 in the back of the audit, if you wanna view that, um, which leaves an unassigned fund balance of just a little more than a million dollars for FY23. This schedule also shows the other major funds that the city has, the Community Development Fund and your Capital Projects Fund. The fourth column is other governmental funds. So this is a combination of special revenue funds, permanent funds, and those schedules are found at the back of the audit if you want a listing of, of your different special revenue funds like um, TIF, ARPA, uh, recreation, your trust funds, your permanent funds, cemetery as well. This graph um, just shows a five-year comparison of your fund balances um, from FY19 through FY23. Um, so you can tell the decrease um, in unassigned fund balance from 22 to 23, uh, you did increase your non-spendable, restricted, and committed. Um, so they're actually more closely balanced. Oh, I should point out, if, if council members have questions, yell them out when they come up, because I think that's an easier way to track it. Yeah. <clears throat> This graph is another five-year comparison um, from FY19 through FY23. It's a comparison of your unassigned fund balance for the year as compared to your operating expenditures. Um, so you can see that there was a decrease for FY23. Good? Is that bad? Is it neutral? What does it mean? It, it means your uh, expenditures exceeded your revenues. But I, it could be good if it's planned. Um, you know, it could be something to look at if you have concerns. Um, I know you have a stated goal that you want at least 15%. Um, um, to be in an unassigned fund balance. So maybe that's an area that you look at to say, you know, is it a planned, you know, do you want to do a planned increase? Do you want to do a, you know, decrease? How do you want to maintain it? So it's not good or bad. It's just, was it planned? Was it unplanned? And is it explainable? Uh, statement E, um, found on page 19, is your statement of revenues, expenditures, and your changes in fund balance. So this is going to show how you got that decrease in your total fund balance. The general fund operating revenues were about $16.5 million, and your operating expenses were $14 million, a little over $14 million. Um, and then when you add in some other sources, transfers in and transfers out, um, that's where you're going to see your net change in fund balance uh, reduction of $754,000. Um, there is a comparison of revenues to budget and expenditures to budget that can be found starting in, um, it's, again, it's another schedule in the back of the book. Um, 
schedule A for revenues and schedule B for expenditures. Um, so you can see the detail, more detail than what's provided here. Your community development fund um, was a decrease of $100,000 and this was a planned decrease of your fund balance with the transfer out. And then your capital projects um, did increase fund balance by $890,000. This pie chart um, just shows where you get most of your revenues and you can tell 75% come from taxes, um, penalties, interests. Uh, your next largest source is your charge charges for services and then grants coming in after that. So it's a good depiction of where you're getting your revenues. And this pie chart shows how you spend your money, uh, most of it, 45% on public safety, um, followed by general government at 22 and public works at about 19%. I like throwing in this comparison chart for revenues and expenses, comparing it current year to prior year. So you can actually tell there's really not much of a change in the percentage of how your revenues and expenditures are broken down. There might be a one to 2% variance from year to year in the different areas. Statement G is found on page 21 and this is your net position of proprietary funds. Um, this first page uh, is basically the assets. As you can see, um, for, especially for your enterprise funds, a large portion, most of it, most of your assets are tied up in, in your fixed assets, in buildings, in infrastructure, and then your accumulated depreciation. The second page of this schedule shows your liabilities and then um, your net position. So, you know, in looking at your net position, I can say water and sewer increased your um, what's invested in capital assets. So, you know, there was an increase in your in your assets for the year um, without adding debt. So you actually self-funded a lot of those assets in these specific funds. Statement H is found on page 23. Um, this is your revenues, expenses, and changes in net position for your proprietary funds. Um, you can see there's an operating revenues is the first line and operating expenses um, so to get your to your operating income for the different funds. So like in water fund, um, there was actually an operating loss, but there was some non-operating income that came in for grants. Um, so the change in net position for the water fund, you increased it by one hundred and forty three thousand dollars. Sewer fund was a slight decrease. Um, parking was increased, and then district heat was a decrease. Um, but I know that's a conversation. I do like to throw in the comparison um, of unassigned fund balance uh, as a percentage of budget for compared to other towns. Um, I will tell you, Barry, Shelburne, and Montpelier, um, y'all all have about the same population. So um, it's a good comparison for those three. I also throw in South Burlington. Um, just to just to understand um, where they've been, you know, we know they've been building a lot 
Um, and so to understand where their fund balance has has risen in the past couple of years, um, Barry's is still smaller than y'all's. Um, and Cheryl, Shelburne, I would say it stayed the same, but a lot of that is information um, just isn't available for us to to view, but there's still a good city town to look at um, comparative wise. And the debt per capita um, compared to these communities, um, as I said, South Burlington, they've been building. They've had, you know, TIF, Market Street, so they've heavily invested. And now you see that debt starting to come down because they're towards the end of that cycle. Um, whereas Barry and Shelburne at this point aren't really investing right now. It's, it's a cycle and it's a cycle that every town um, has to go through. So you have to, and then yours at the end. So um, you did increase for this year. There was the bond sold um, in July of 22. So that's the increase that you see there. Um, so for the presentation on the actual audit, the, those are the slides I have. Were there any other questions? Okay. Um, the notes to the audit, there's a lot of good information in there. Um, very detail oriented, but it's it's good um, pertaining to all the schedules. Uh, I know Sarah's read it <laughs> back and forth several times. If she can't answer your question, feel free to, to reach out to me if there are any questions. Um, the other, there are two other letters that we issue as part of our audit. One is called um, the SAS 114. I don't know that that was included. It was, okay. So, but basically the point of that letter is, is to let you know if we had any difficulties with management and I'm pleased to report that we did not this year. Um, not that we have in the past, <laughs> um, but specifically none this year. Um, and then we also issue a management letter, and that's usually pertained to, you know, internal controls. Did we find something that might need to have best practices um, or suggestions for improvement? And I will say for FY23, there were no comments in that letter. So, um, which I have to say, um, I have to give props to Sarah, Heather, Todd, because you know, normally when you prepare for an audit, that starts July 1st. Um, mm. And <laughs> you had a small thing that happened for y'all. Um, and so, and then not to mention the office moving a couple of times just made things, you know, that much more difficult. So um, I really have to have to give them props for um, sticking with it, for getting the job done and for allowing this audit to be um Pretty clean. So, anything Thanks. else? Anyone have any questions? <clears throat> Karen. Yes, thank you for such a thorough presentation and for your work. And thank you to Sarah and your department for all the great work that you've done. Tim? Yep. Question. This is still I've been on the council less than a year. So, it, it is a learning piece turning. Not all the way through it, to be honest with you, but um, trying to understand it, and there's just a different perspective than maybe we've discussed at our meetings throughout the year. So, one that I just, well, I've got you here that's interesting is on page 47. Um, just looking at it's basically the summary of outstanding bonds and notes. Um, thank you. And I guess my question is kind of looking at this is is something that we need to be aware of, or maybe I'm just not reading it right, but it looks like in 2029 to 33, there's going to be a period with um, a really big increase in our payments. For, uh, yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, for reporting purposes, um, in the disclosure checklist you have to do for this report, the first five years are broken out individually, and then they're lumped in five-year periods. Um, so I'm so that's the total for the five years, that's, not per that's year. That's not per year. That's the total for each of like, the five years. You. Yeah. <laughs> it's cumulative, not yeah, actually. Wait, wait. No panic. <laughs> kind of was. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we had our own Act 127 going. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a great, great thing for us to know. Yeah. Anybody else? 
Yes, Sam. Well, I just want to say that, uh, I mean, I, you know, I looked at this and tried to stay awake as long as I could. Um, so I appreciate the report and, you know, I, I could read it um, again and again, and I would still rely on your opinion. Uh, at some point, though, Sarah, I may I may ask you a question or two. Yeah, just as as Tim says, it's been kind of a learning experience for me, and um, I, I doubt all. I mean, I'm not looking for anything. I just want to understand it better. So, I was an auditor for eight years, so I'm happy to run through this with you. <laughs> so, what you're saying is this stuff is fun for you? Love it. <laughs> <laughs> Not so much for many of the rest of us, <laughs> I'm sure. Donna. Make sure Sarah and your staff go back and tell them That's kudos, what? really. Mm -hmm. It is amazing. I mean, that you do it with such glowing remarks anyways, but then throughout all the movement, moving in the office, it's just had to be very, very chaotic. So yeah, they're, they're double listening. Things. <laughs> double things. <laughs> Thank you. All right. And... I think we're set, Palin. Do you have anything? Don't want to leave you out. Okay. Great. Thanks so much. I appreciate this. It's good to know that things are working well. Um, next up, um, <clears throat> I understand that uh, from Mike that we're taking uh, item seven off for tonight. The uh, property uh, acquisition. Yeah, so... Property acquisitions, <clears throat> excuse me, is coming off for tonight. Uh, the two of the three applicants are away for the vacation. We contacted the third person, and uh, he was fine delaying the conversation till after town meeting day. So we'll have it on the thirteenth. So hopefully it won't be a long presentation, but we will pick that up after town meeting day. Great, thanks. Yeah, after town meeting day always is next week, and. We don't have a meeting the day after town meeting the way we sometimes do. All right, we're up to item eight, uh, zoning, second reading of, or the second public hearing of the zoning amendments. Good evening, Mayor, good evening, Council. I'm Mike Miller. I'm the planning director for the city. And I'm gonna go through the zoning, I'll quickly go through the zoning presentation here. That one out. I saw on the on the screen we had a few new faces. Um, and we have a couple people in the audience who um, at least one I haven't recognized. So we'll quickly go through the public hearing for the zoning and river hazard regulations. So I'm gonna quickly run through the process, uh, where, where the proposals, where to find the proposals if you wanna see them uh, and describe the changes to the regulations, each one of them, and then we'll have some next steps and some questions and comments. And this is a public hearing, so this is really all about the public hearing process. And- Mike, uh, are you gonna share your screen? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> And in case it wasn't obvious, the, I'm opening the public hearing. I think I said that, but. My apologies, there we go. So, um... I see it on the screen, so I assume it's on the Zoom and it's not. Um, yep. So, uh, so what we're the process? This is the second of two public hearings. Um, this is really two hearings for two things. It's kind of a double public hearing because uh, the Unified Development Regulations, which are also known as the Zoning Bylaws, are one set, and River Hazard are another set. Um, because we're having this conversation, and people may jump back and forth. We're just having one hearing to cover both of these. You have to have two hearings, and this is the second. The first one was on Valentine's Day, and this is the second one, and the council can have additional hearings if you choose. I'm actually expecting that you probably will end up having one more because if there's a substantial change, then there has to be another hearing, so that way the 
substantial change can go back to the planning commission for comment. There is not another hearing at the planning commission. There is simply an opportunity for the planning commission to provide you comment on whether they agree, disagree, what their concerns might be about those changes. I expect based on conversations I've heard uh, with at, at various times with committees, um, if you agree with any of those changes that they'd probably be substantial and that's country club road and the, um, potentially the, the shading requirements. So we'll get have more conversation when we get there. Um, but I would hope, expect that we might be able to um, approve the river hazard regulations tonight, but we'll see how that goes too. So if you're looking for proposals, because if there is another hearing, you would have this opportunity. If you go to the main page, uh, zoning and floodplain regulations is on the right hand side. And if you click on that, it would take you to the zoning subdivisions uh, regulations page where we put the draft regulations right at the top. And you have both the zoning, the draft zoning map, and a list of the zoning changes, which is a shortcut way because the zoning regulations are very long. If you just want to kind of get a summary of what each one of the changes were, they are in there. And so all those date, all those items are to date the changes that have been made since they have been proposed since our last uh, hearing. Yes. Yep. It includes all the changes that I will go over tonight. It is updated. So really quickly, the zoning map changes, um, we've talked about them. There's a change for 155 Northfield Street. Um, a Country Club Road is a, is a larger change. 29 Sibley is a small parcel change. Uh, it was a merger and just needs a zoning match. Um, we're just highlighting that that's there. And some home act changes because of uh, to residential 24 district. Uh, on the left is the Country Club Road. It's really hard to tell. The little two symbol is on the roundabout. And um, it is so the one four is at the top of the hill. That is the open area in the Country Club. And nine dash nine is the change that's proposed for the upper part. All of the area, nine nine and one four, those are all your open areas of the Country Club. None of the forested areas of the Country Club Road property are included in these changes. So these just include the two open areas. 999 is, is rural still? 99 was rural and is being proposed to be residential 3000. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, what was circled there is that's the small change that was on Sibley Street, very small. Uh, and then there is a change due to statute, the Home Act. There was a requirement that said anything, any districts, any areas with sewer and water have to be zoned at five acre zoning, which is about residential 9,000, very, very close to that. Um, so these two districts up in Town Hill and a little parcel there, part of a parcel that's uh, Casey Ellison's part of um, Sabin's Pasture. It's not Sabin's Pasture, but it's next to it, um, also needs to get rezoned. So Did you say five acre or fifth of an acre? Fifth of an acre, excuse okay. me, one, one unit, yeah. <laughs> Oh, one unit per five units per one acre. Here we go. Which is what forty three or three thousand six hundred, right? Yep, for one for an acre. So, um, which when we get here, the changes in the text as a result of these uh, to eliminate the twenty four thousand, we moved those neighborhoods to the residential nine thousand, and we had to change the density to of residential 9,000 to one unit per 8,712 square feet, which is five units an acre. So rather than change the name of residential 9,000, we just kept it the same and the density is a little bit lower. There are proposals uh, and we'll quickly go through these, um, through the list I have, which uh, I gave to all the counselors. Um, just so we've got a quick checklist when we get there. But as the overview, uh, there are a number of housing related changes that were proposed by Planning Commission, uh, change the use table to add large and small multi-unit. Rather, right now, our zoning has multi-family as anything with more than five. Uh, we just split it into a small multi-family, which is five to 14, and one that's 15 or more. And that just gave us the ability to make more of the small multi-families permitted uses in certain districts. So if you want to do six buildings, six units, in a in an urban center area, you could do it as a permitted use as opposed to a conditional use because it's going to not have as much impact. 
we added more types of congregate housing options and made them match um, with dwelling unit type housings. We view housing in two different ways. One's a dwelling unit where you own all the components and the other one is congregate housing where you might share some. You might have your own room and share um, kitchen. Some others may share bathroom facilities. Mike, I was talking to someone the other day and he raised the question about um, co-housing and uh, would, would that come within congregate housing? I always say it depends on how you, because people can define co-housing a little bit differently. So I usually just go through and say, if you, there, there are five components to a dwelling unit. Um, you have your kitchen, your bathroom, your living area, your bedroom, and one other. Yeah, you got, you got, <laughs> <laughs> but you got five, five requirements that are in there. Um, and if you have all five and you own and occupy all five, that that's a dwelling unit. If you share any one of them, um, then you're considered congregate housing. Um, so the classic is, of course, you live in a dormitory, you have your own room, that's your room, you have a key to the room, you have exclusive right to that room, but you share the bathroom and you go to a uh, community um, place to have you had to have your meals. Other places, some senior living facilities, you might have your own room um, and your own bathroom, but you might still share the living, uh, the, some of the other facilities. So there's, it just depends how the arrangement is made. It depends on whether it technically qualifies as a congregate housing. Thanks. Well, is this added to accommodate existing uh, buildings? Uh, this was really intended. We were trying to to do a fair housing analysis of our resident of our residential categories, and what we found was that we were continuously holding congregate housing to a higher standard than we were dwelling units. So, um, you know, a small boarding facility might be a um, you know you might be able to put in a five unit apartment as a permitted use, but if you want to put in a small boarding facility that would be a conditional use. And so we just tried to even them up, try to make them fairer. If it's a, if it's a small unit, it's going to match up to a small dwelling unit and we'll treat them fairly. So we're not discriminating against a certain housing type. Uh, and the hope is that this will give more opportunities um, for these types of housing units to, to come online. Um, as just as a point for most um, people who might not know, 40% of all the households in Montpelier are single people, people living alone. Hmm. Um, congregate housing options, uh, you know, it has a bad reputation. It has um, a, a lot of negativity that comes in with it. But the reality is when you've got so much of your population that is living by themselves, congregate housing options make a lot of sense for a number of people. And it's not a requirement that people live that way. It's just providing more options for people. So had, had proposals been made that had to be turned down because we didn't, didn't have this or... No, we just we're have just to, looking forward to. We're trying to look forward, and we were like we said, we we're just trying to do a fair housing analysis. We we want to make sure we're not inadvertently having rules to setting up rules to make higher hurdles for projects that, other than for their reputation, you know, they they shouldn't be held to a higher standard. Um, yeah, I've been involved a little bit, and other colleagues have been involved with issues where. Uh, a group home for uh, mental uh, mental health recipients might the towns towns have tried to keep those out, which we obviously don't want to do. And and group homes have special protections under state law, which is why I've kind of not tried to use the example of a group home okay. for the purposes of talking about congregate living. But I know, you know, we I had, you know, I've had projects and and I had one in Barry that was perfectly fine. Over at Gusto's, there were each there were two units. One each one had the living space and a kitchen, but they shared a bathroom in the middle. So because they shared a facility, technically they were a boarding house. And so they had to get a permit as a boarding house. Um, in other places, you know, we there there are a lot of opportunities, I think, especially as people are living alone where having your own living space with your own bathroom and having your own space, but sharing those living and kitchen facilities is going to make a lot of sense, especially maybe if you're um, seniors or if you're younger, there, there are opportunities for people to live in more the congregate housing options without really 
disrupting um, the neighborhoods in in the area. And we'll we'll see what comes up. We're just at this point making the rules and trying to make them fair. If it's something small, it'll be treated differently. And mm -hmm. as these get bigger and bigger, obviously, if you're going to do a big dormitory, you're going to be treated the same as a big multi-unit building. So those protections will still be in place. Michael, could we go back to that 40% single households? Mm -hmm. Now, is that from the census? How do you know yep. that? It's from the census. Okay. Yeah, we... And do you have an... Within that data, is there approximate square footage that these individuals live in? I don't. I don't have that information. We do know the number of people living alone. That's a pretty easy number to come up with, and it always surprises people. People think, "Well, we got to build housing well, units for families. Yeah, where would just, where would a mom and pop and a child want to live?" Well, only well, less than usually it's about seven to eight percent of households have two parents and one person 18, 18 years or under. So you're talking about less than 10% of all households are are those fam traditional family units. Um, overwhelmingly, families are um, either single family households, uh, uh, two, un uh, two adults living together, whether married or unmarried, without children, um, and people living alone. So those really are, are housing demographics much of our housing was built in an age when people had big families. And that's why we've tried to adjust our zoning to therefore allow them to be take, keep our existing houses. Let's break them into smaller pieces so we can better utilize them. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, so really quick um, expanded um, rights for non. Oh, so the non-conforming parcels, People who have been paying attention to this for a while know that if you've got a conforming lot, you can have a duplex regardless of density. Uh, that was passed in 2018. Um, it's been successful. There's now a proposal to up that to four units. So if you've got a conforming parcel, regardless of density, you could have up to four units. You still have to meet all, all the other requirements of zoning. You still have to have your parking spaces and everything else if it's required. Um, but the hope is that we would get into this question of these large homes from the turn of the century, turn of the last century that were built for large families, this might provide some opportunities to open up some of the these units and make them um, more usable. Um, because sometimes the density is what stops them. And that has been a barrier. Hmm. Uh, any parcel in the design review district uh, will not have a maximum density. So currently in urban center one, two, and three, we don't have a density requirement. Uh, as we had a study that was done that said we could probably expand this to more districts. We've had a number of proposals in the year that didn't, that weren't successful, but the premise of what the information we got from AARP and the Congress for New Urbanism was that if you have got good design standards, you don't need to have a maximum density um, because it really is however many units you can fit in a building, whether that's for two bedrooms or eight one bedrooms. Well, eight one bedrooms is eight units an acre and four two bedrooms is four units an acre. And you're like, well, that really is this, almost the same, but not according. So density starts taking away the density, gives the building owner the flexibility to try to match their building to what they believe the, the demographic need is. Um, so they'll, if they see a lot more families, they'll make more two unit and three units. If they see a lot more single people, they might break them into more single units. Question? Yep. So it says any project in design review district or CC exempt from density, CC capital complex. Capital complex. Thank you. Yep. So that was the correction that we had to make last time. Um, so the other changes, we made some changes to the demolition provisions to address recent cases. I'm going to go through a list in a minute of some other changes that have gone through. We also made changes to the sign rules, removal of the solar and access requirements, move the boundary line adjustment rules from um, subdivisions into administrative, and made permanent interim emergency housing rules. And there are other typos that were fixed. We also made the three changes here. Um, adding the comp capital complex was one and adding in some time for delayed project changes. So that's if a permit is still valid, we're going to give it another extra year to commence development. And we'll talk about that a little bit more after the overview. 
the river hazard changes, really looking at a few um, additional changes to critical facilities mm -hmm. and some minor technical changes. And so um, I just want to reiterate, so the entire zoning river hazard is open to change. Uh, when a public hearing comes up, it's not just about what's being proposed. Substantial changes must go back to the planning commission for comment, which I had mentioned, and current expectations that we'll need one more meeting due to the country club road zoning changes. We did get written comments from uh, Mr. Thomas Weiss. I've got responses to all of them, which I'll go through pretty quickly, depending on what process we want to use. Um, and there was a question from Mr. Harper on the sign last time. I'll answer those questions. And um, then we'll review Country Club Road uh, and the solar. Um, and I put these into a checklist. I'm going to stop sharing my screen right now, which I thought, if everyone's OK with that, I'll go through that. I, I put it on your, your table, which um, I felt if we kind of broke it and went into these really quickly, I could go through them rather than having us be here till midnight. If I could, if we could kind of narrow things down to a few questions that are left, and I think that's going to be Country Club Road and the solar. But if anyone puts anything else on, that's perfectly fine. But um, if you want, I can do the river hazard first. Sure, that's fine. But and to be clear, what you think is that there are already enough changes in the zoning bylaw that they are considered major changes and they will need to go back for review to the uh if, to the planning commission yes if we if the council votes to not go with the changes i've made changes as draft changes in the bylaws um because that was kind of the discussion we had at the last meeting if everybody said nope go back to the original planning commission version and we're going to adopt that you could adopt that tonight my expectation is that's probably not where the direction we're going to go, but that's mm -hmm. your choice, not mine. Mm -hmm. um, so if we go with what's in the current draft, <laughs> we will have to go back for one more, one more meeting. Okay. Thanks. All right. All right. So really quick, there are three decision points on river hazard regulations. Um, I don't think they're, they're too big. And then I'll go quickly through uh, Thomas's questions, and then I guess we can op maybe open it up to questions and comments on the river hazard, and then maybe we can get that one put to bed. Yep. So the three decision points we have on the river hazard is uh, the proposal is to hold critical facilities to higher standards, the 0.2% chance event. Some people may call that the 500-year event. Or it's the 0.2% event. Um, and critical facilities are those that are defined as class three and class four buildings by the building code. So that is generally buildings that are uh, your police stations, fire stations, schools, nursing homes, hospitals. Um, uh, there's a, a very specific list that is in building code. And so we could make that list as big or small, or we could choose whichever facilities we want. The suggestion that comes out generally, if you were to look across the country, is they use the building code standards for critical facilities. And we have a definition of that already. We have the proposal to be the class three and class four buildings gotcha. as defined in the building code. Okay. And the last thing, it's not really a, that major of a thing, but we're going to also remove the prohibition on using sheetrock when doing non-substantial improvements. So as many of you who got flooded know um, sometimes if you get a non, if you get a substantial improvement, you're in a completely different class. But sometimes there's a lot of these non-substantial improvements that come up, whether it's from non-substantial damage or just making improvements. And there's currently a prohibition against using sheetrock. Uh, well, the reality of what happens is when water gets in, you've got to dry out what's behind it. Sheetrock's really easy to cut off, dry, put new sheetrock back on. It's cheap economical is the way everybody does it. And so we just want to go through, it's what we've basically told everybody, do it that way. We just now want to make the rules kind of match what we've been telling everybody to do anyways, because it doesn't make sense to put tile, non-porous things there. We know water's going to get behind it. And then you have an expensive process of removing expensive tile to get behind it because it wasn't built, when a building is built in the first place to be um, floodable, they're built without spaces behind them. 
we have walls that have spaces behind them. So you really can't. So those were the three suggestions. Um, and I'll quickly run through the comments that um, Mr. Weiss gave us at the last meeting. Um, and I'm going to summarize his. He's more than welcome to come in and say I've I've misrepresented them. But um, the suggest first suggestion was used to kind of use 1927 flood as the flood of record. And he also had a recommendation to increase the free board. And so my comment on that is uh, 1927 precedes two of the floods. He pointed out that one of the flood one of the dams, excuse me, one of the we have three major dams. One of them actually was built before 27. Uh, he mm -hmm. did point that out to me. The other two were built afterwards. But what we have are scientifically determined maps right now that are based on the federal standards. These are the FEMA NFIP maps. Um, there are really no maps for 1927. NFIP is National, National Flood, Flood Insurance, Insurance Program. Program. Yes. So if we want to increase protection, we should use the existing maps and we could add more freeboard. Uh, freeboard is you could tell somebody to build the base flood elevation. Freeboard says, well, you got to build two feet above it. That's two feet of freeboard as we define it. So you could require people to add three feet of freeboard if you want. So where is two feet of freeboard in relation to 1927? I don't have an exact number, but it's going to be um, the, the flood of 27 was the floor of this building. The second floor, water got up to this floor in 27. So it's a couple, two feet of freeboard, it's a couple of feet below that. It's going to be yeah, a couple of feet below that. Mm -hmm. um, but it's in the flood that happened in June, the water got to just lapping on the doors of um, city center, which was built to, to one, it was built, it was built to uh, no feet above. It was built to base flood, of, flood elevation mm -hmm. and the water got just up to it. The buildings that were built two feet above had plenty of room, like the transit center. Um, Lauren. Thanks. Um, so I, I know there's been a lot of talk of kind of the how outdated the federal maps are and the state I believe is doing some pretty extensive mapping or there's some contracts to be doing some like would this tie us to existing old FEMA maps or would it be able to update like if the state adopts newer maps or if FEMA eventually adopts newer maps as an update with those or is this tying us into like a specific dated um, our map? our flood maps, our regulations tie ourselves to the most recently adopted flood map. So if the flood maps are readopted, and ours are not as bad, other parts of the state are really bad. Ours were actually redone in 2007 and were brought online like 2013. So they're not, ours from for Washington County are not that bad. They're really bad in other parts of the state that were still in the 70s or 80s. So uh, we're fortunate to have been updated from 80 to 2013, a few years ago. So those aren't bad. If they get updated, um, the two feet of free board would then be from the new map elevations. So a new FEMA adopted, but like if I, I am pretty sure that Vermont is doing some like much more intensive, like much more detailed mapping than what FEMA typically does, but we wouldn't be able to use that. So it, it could be more like location specific where um, it just, it's a much finer grain mapping. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I of... think, I think they are. And getting to the, the second point that um, Thomas made, which was that he wanted lands adjacent to the floodplain that are below DFE, design flood elevation, those two foot of free board should also be regulated. So think about if a floodplain is um, 520 feet in elevation and it's going down towards the river and you're right here, you're building a new project, you have to build the 522. Um, so you're two feet above that, that elevation. If you happen to be just one foot over uphill and you're 520.1, you don't have any requirements and you can dig a hole and put a basement. That's the way the rules work. And we're kind of like, well, well, you just made these guys be up here. Shouldn't you follow this out to where 522 line is and say anybody in the middle also has to elevate if you're building something new? And I agree, absolutely. And so connecting um, Thomas's suggestion with your comment, 
they are going through right now to do more revisions to our flood maps, which is excellent. Even though they're not that old, they are redoing ours. So what we're going to ask, what I'm going to be pushing for with them is that they also map when they give us the floodplain, that they give us that line. So if we're going to keep it freeboard at two feet, I'm going to ask them to give me the, what is the floodplain look like? So that way, at least council will have the option to then adopt regulations to regulate that area. It won't be automatic. We'd have to come back, have to have public hearings, have that conversation. But it only makes sense that we would have the standards. You're not required to buy flood insurance in those areas, but we would require you to elevate. So that way, if there's a flood that's that much higher, we don't have a lot of people getting damaged because they're just outside of the line. So we are going to ask. They are doing the mapping. We are going to try to get that map, uh, but we really can't do that right now simply because we don't have the map. And but and getting back to Lauren's question, is the uh, proposed ordinance saying the most recent FEMA map, or would it allow for us to use uh, a, a state adopted map that's more recent than the most recent FEMA map? Ours reference the FEMA map. Okay, thank you. Done. Is that also sort of included with any sort of standard of FEMA and therefore more in sync with them and their rules? It's we are in we are a community rating system, so we are in CRS. So that whole program is based on the the FEMA NFIP National Flood Insurance maps. So if we adopted higher different maps, we would have to go through and demonstrate that they are in all places higher than and of higher a detail and higher whatever of the you know it'd have to fully encompass what is in the nfip map okay um uh he commented about uh, the term 500 years floodplain shouldn't be used i didn't think we did but he was right he caught a few i found them i changed them uh he had a suggestion to uh add references to how to find the state statutes uh, I didn't make any changes about that. I kind of feel this is the digital age. I think most of these are pretty easy to find with a with a quick Google. Uh, and such things change can also change pretty quickly. And so putting references in in a document like this that may not change uh, can be problematic. Uh, suggestion to use the Vermont building codes. He's absolutely correct. We there is no Vermont building code. It is the Vermont Fire and Safety Building Code. And so I made that change. We also could reference our city building regulations, chapter four of the city code of ordinances, if the council chooses. Uh, the last suggestion he made was to expand the definition of um, uh, critical facilities that we talked about earlier to specifically reference the location of the definition of the category three and category four. Um, my suggestion is that actually being, uh, it's actually a benefit to keep the reference a little bit vague or a little bit general, uh, referring to the codes. If we reprint the list into the regulations and the list changes in the code, then we can't just use the correct code. We've got to update the zoning in order to put the correct code in there. Um, if they change their code and change the reference number in their code such that reference, you know, 1611 becomes 1612 because they added another 1610, then our reference is going to be incorrect and we got to go back. So sometimes um, keeping them a little bit general is a little bit better. Most of these we're going to know about, we've got the build, we've got a building code and building inspector right in our office. So hospital, school, police, nurse station, nur um, police stations, nursing facilities. We're not going to have very many of these applications coming in and we're going to very quickly know which ones are going to have to meet this higher standard of building two feet above the 500 year, as opposed to two feet above the 100 year. That's, that's what the critical facilities is saying. You have to build up effectively. It's going to be about another foot higher. I was going to say, okay. So it's about foot <laughs> Okay. So is that, that's it. Is that, that's it for flood. That's it. For so, okay. So I'm going to take uh, comments from the public and try to keep things as organized as possible. Let's take, comments from the public on the uh, flood uh, regulations first. And Dr. Weiss, you're here. Do you have uh, anything to say about that? I oh, appreciate it. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. I uh...
Good evening. I'm Thomas Weiss, uh, resident of Montpelier, District 2, um, and I appreciate everything that Mike said about my comments, and I can accept them all. I, I would appreciate having more in critical facilities, uh, not critical facilities, you know, I'd, I'd appreciate if, if that extra elevation were added to everything. Uh, housing and, and all of those things. I realize it's added expense and it's a choice that you're going to have to weigh as to who, if any, is going to have this extra expense by having to, to protect the higher flood. As I mentioned last week, I've done a lot of flood studies, the hydrology, the stream flow hydraulics, and I just think the higher we build anything, the better we are because we're always going to have a bigger flood. Um, my comment on the classes three and four is not that we put them in the code per se, but when I look up or when anybody looks up on the fire and safety division site, um, all that's there is the changes that Vermont has made to the national building code. And so one has to go to the National Building Code to find the list of classes three and four. So my comment was more that in order to find the classes three and four, you actually have to go to the National Building Code because they are not in the one we get from the Fire and Safety Division. Uh, it can get a little complicated, and if you leave it out, that's the way it goes. I understand being able to talk to the building inspector and, and getting that information. I do have one more comment, which has to do with the way Section 644, which is design flood elevation as two feet above the flood of 1% annual probability, and the critical facilities in Section 720, which are two feet above the 0.2% annual probability flood. Uh, and, and when I was going through the documents, there are several areas that reference the design flood elevation. For example, fuel tanks have to be built so that their filler pipes and vent pipes are above the design flood elevation, which is a foot lower than the critical facilities would have. But it's not clear that a fuel tank at a critical facility would have to meet that extra foot of elevation. So it it's I guess I'm suggesting and I, and I know that sounds like Mike was hoping that there weren't going to be significant changes, but to look through the code or the bylaws and see what the design flood elevation references are and whether they would need to be changed for the uh, for the critical facilities. And if you only go with critical facilities, that's great. You know, as I said, the more we can get higher, the better. I, I I appreciate it. If you don't get everything, well, that's your decision. Okay. You're the policymakers. Thanks. I'm the technical guy. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, are there any other members of the public uh, out there in, in Zoom land who would like to be heard on this uh, proposal? And then I'll get members of the council and I'll get uh, Mike's response to that last uh, comment. Or probably in reverse order. Okay, so Mike, what's... Uh... Oh, I'm sorry. Sure. <laughs> 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 so, Mike, what are your thoughts about that last comment? So, yeah, if I had a couple minutes, I could probably tweak. I think it's I think it's okay, but I mean, if if I were, I see where um, 
Mr. Weiss is going with the comments because this one it defines it for everything else is defined they define it as um, design flood elevation and the free free board requirement is two feet. If we had a, the similar provision, or at least if the reference in critical facilities, basically stating that the design flood elevation for critical facilities is two feet above the 500 year, then anytime you see DFE in the rules, based on which path you're going down, you know where how, how that applies but it didn't use the word design flood elevation in the critical facilities. So if that were kind of tucked in there, then that kind of closes that loop. Although I think in most cases, I think it would be generally understood based on how the rules are written, that that's the intent of where the board wants to go. But. So just thinking about what you're saying, we could adopt it with the changes you've given us tonight, or you probably would want to take it back to make sure you were doing it right uh, and have it on for a different, for another meeting also. I guess I would leave that in, in, as I said, I think, I mean, it's a really subtle difference. I mean, I, I tend to be a little bit of a perfectionist to make sure I leave as few holes for an attorney to wiggle into as, you know, usually that's what we're trying to do is how would I, if I were, if I didn't want to meet this rule, how would I fight it in court? And that's how we kind of read the rules. And I think some of you have a really hard time keeping a straight face and going through and saying that because this technically did not say the word design flood elevation that when we refer to the design flood elevation elsewhere, it doesn't count. Okay. Donna. If you feel it's already inferred, inserting that phrase will be a significant change that you have to go back to the commission for? No, it wouldn't be a significant change. It's just, I don't have that phraseology changed and, and maybe when because we're not voting on this right now, mm -hmm. when we're on our break at 8.30, I'll spend a couple minutes in coming up with a way that, because we'll vote on that. I'll make a proposal when we have that conversation of how to add the DFE language in there to clean to close that up. Okay. Anybody else, any other members have comments or questions? I guess, I mean, I, I think this is a good step. I do agree. I, it seems like as much as possible moving towards not doing new developments in blood prone ways just seems smart and prudent. I mean, it seems um, like too obvious to even say, but it seems like a good step and like, let's keep moving in this direction would be my hope. Okay, anyone else, uh, any other members have any comments or questions? Then what I think what I will do is close the public hearing on the uh, on the flood ordinance and uh, <clears throat> move to the public hearing on the which we've already opened on the on the zoning. And then we'll take a break and we'll we'll, we'll have a chance to vote on the flood rules. All right, so I'm going to go through really quick some of these I had already mentioned in my presentation, but I'm going to go through these and inserting comments that we've had. Um, again, uh, Mr. Weiss gave us a, a written list of comments. Want to make sure anytime anybody sends us comments, we do take them seriously. We do review them. Uh, we don't always agree with them, and we don't always put them in. But where where people make good good valid points, we do want to go through, or we want to go and answer those questions. So, so we've got this. We can just follow along with the sheet. Yeah, you want to follow yeah, along. Yep. Um, and I'm going to skip the two biggies, um, Country Club Road, rezoning, and shading, because those are going to, I expect we're going to have debate on. But this mm -hmm. quick summary is to go through all the other things that are in the zoning, because there are a lot of policy changes. I want to make sure we don't get a thought that I'm sneaking something in and nobody knows about it. Um, so these, there are a lot of technical changes I'm not going over, but these are the ones that have some amount of policy change to them. Um, we went over those zoning map changes that are in there. 
Um, we're saving Country Club Road. Um, Mr. Weiss had a question about the hill um, behind the Capitol in Urban Center One. Why is that in Urban Center One when it's the hill that goes up the thing? As a rule, districts lines follow property lines as much as possible. In this case, that is the land that the State House is on, the Capitol building, all the same parcel. Uh, it's completely exempt from zoning. So we couldn't do anything on that anyways. We could we could zone that whatever we want. And um, as a part of state law, it is regulated by the legislature, not even by BGS. It is regulated and controlled by um, the legislature. So the state could build whatever it wants on that property, and no, there's nothing we can do about it. Absolutely nothing. <laughs> um, so the HOME Act changes. Um, they're generally required by law, as I pointed out, moving the neighborhoods, Res 9 to 8,700. That's not really a policy decision, but that'll be one change. There was a question from Mr. Weiss about the density appearing wrong. He pointed out about residential 6,000. He thought a duplex should also be, uh, and a triplex and quadplex or, or, or those would, would also be. Under state law, under the HOME Act, duplexes must be allowed in a district and they have to, they can meet all the same standards. So if you have a density requirement of one unit per 6,000, you would need 12,000 for a duplex under state law. Um, now our zoning already allows it for most cases anyways, but um, the density technically still applies and I had this confirmed with our city attorney. So it's, um, that's it's not may not be what the legislature intended, but uh, as anyone who I write zoning bylaws, it doesn't depend what I intended to write into the zoning. It's what I actually do write into the zoning. And in this case, they the way they worded it, density still applies. But we have already overridden that in most cases, including in 3002. He had a question. That is the part that says if you're on water and sewer and you have a conforming lot, you can have a duplex regardless of density. And he had a question of whether or not that should also apply to the ones that are non-conforming lots. And I think based on the density question I just answered, it does not get that benefit. So I think we're okay in that category as well. Um, but you have the right if you wanted to as council to go through and say, we don't care strike that piece and allow non-conforming parcels to have the same rights as conforming parcels. So there, there are some uh, properties in the city, uh, like at my house, where we're on city water, we have a, a septic system, and the arrangement is that the city pays to have it uh, pumped out every three years. Does that mean that I we're not within that uh, category because we're not on city sewer. Correct, you or, would not qualify for that. And the pumping doesn't change that. The pumping doesn't change that, okay. no. Uh, you, council, you could go and change that rule. The way the rule was written, it was intended. In 2018, we were trying to make a big jump from what was from 2006. to, And so we rezoned everything to be 90% conforming. So there's still 10% of the parcels non-conforming. But we also have a number of parcels, number of properties that only have sewer or water or don't have either. And so we just allowed the duplexes. And this is going to go when we get to that next question of fourplexes. You also wouldn't get the benefit of being able to do the fourplexes because you aren't on sewer and water. Mm -hmm. You need to be on sewer and water and have a conforming lot. And you have the right to change that rule. You guys could say anybody has that right, but the way it was proposed in 2018, that was adopted into 2018, only people who have conforming lots and sewer and water can get those benefits. So, so we had a we had an issue in uh, the assessments this year where a property had sewer and water, but it went through. It was it, it appears to me it was a parcel that was divided after sewer and water were supplied. And so now the property in the rear has sewer and water that goes through the basement of the property in front. And the property in front is where it's been shut off. So this rule, I mean, this rule would prevent that from happening. Well, it would, well, if we changed it to include non-conforming, it would, it would allow that. Uh, 
it's assuming the parcel was conforming, it would have access to sewer and water. It not having sewer and water is not, that's for a, a different reason. That's more for a civil issue reason. It's, it's for a different reason. So if they turned the water on, they would it would conform they it would conform and they could have the access but okay donna just going back to jack's property he says is non-conforming and and so and, and not on sewer and so this is conforming it just doesn't have oh. sewer well, yep. in either case is there still not an out for a property to say you know i am an exception and petition to have something changed so that they could do multi units get a variance he would if, if jack wanted to go through and, and go to four units he would have to meet the density requirement so if he's got enough land to um so if he's in residential six thousand and he has a twenty four thousand square foot lot he could do it he just um will need to meet that the permits for that requirement but he doesn't get to do it if he only has a 6,000 square foot lot in a 6,000 square foot district. He wouldn't be able to put four units in. Right. But I was just thinking that people would still have the option to go at least a few steps beyond the initial, no, you can't. That's all. And, and you could go through and say everybody, regardless, has the right to do a duplex. That is certainly, um, and you could allow it for for quadplexes as well um, and say, even if you're non-conforming, you can do it um, because the sewer is going to be regulated when um, you know, Jack can't put in four more units unless he expands his septic field and his septic tank four times bigger to meet state rules. So chances are good he wouldn't be able to do it for that reason. And once he starts expanding his septic field he's got to meet all the new rules so he's got to have a, a an existing and a backup site and he's got to have not i'm not doing any of that stuff. <laughs> this this really isn't about it's, what it's I'm hypothetical do. the hypothetical works so it, it, it's yeah, a good example good. for we could you could go through and say i know we have this thing that says you have to be conforming but let's get rid of that and just say anybody who's got it can can do it um as we said, we only did it because we were we were trying to be cautious and and take small steps and make sure the public didn't think that everybody with every tiny lot was going to be able to drop duplexes on a, on a lot that was a third the size of a required lot. And it hasn't been an issue since 2018. And we haven't had an issue yeah. so far, no. Okay. Tim. The conforming issue. So how far does that go if it's somebody has 40 feet of street frontage? And the zoning is maybe there wasn't even zoning when their house was built, and now zoning requires sixty feet of road frontage or something. So would that be a non-conforming lot? I don't know. Uh, I'd have to take a, a look at it. I don't know if it says if it's based on lot size three zero zero two. any conforming parcel so technically yes as it's written if you did not have appropriate frontage um then you could also be excluded even if you've got the correct size because it says non-conforming parcel i don't know how many non-conforming parcels we have based on frontage because i know that would, i know that'd be your next question <laughs> i don't know that I, number. I, I own a few of them so i know there's at least a few yeah we did we did <laughs> we did decrease a lot of lot frontages as well so when we when we did those rules we did try to capture that um we won't say we were perfect there are a lot of numbers to address in a lot of different districts so we think we've got that that wasn't one of the ones we took a really hard look at but we think we've got those but again if the issue of the non-conforming lot is a concern. We can, that's not a requirement. The square footage was really the big thing, as I recall. And uh, and I, I was struck by how, you know, some people had a real emotional reaction to being told that they were non-conforming. And it was not, didn't mean that they were doing anything wrong. It was just, okay, keep moving. All right, and we can go through, we can come back and revisit any of these. Um, 
Uh, the use table needs to allow multi-unit dwellings as either permitted or conditional. Uh, that was another comment that the use table needs to allow multi-unit as either permitted or conditional. And the rule under state law, the new state law, the Home Act, is that only districts with water and sewer need to meet this standard. And in our districts, we, all the ones with utilities do meet that requirement. Uh, housing and density changes, uh, changes to the use table we went over. Um, the expanded density is another recommended policy. We went over that. That's now saying instead of two, it would be four. Any project in design review would be exempt from density. We've gone over that. There were major uh, changes to the demolition rules. Um, and we had a comment from uh, Mr. Weiss again that the standard does not anticipate future redevelopment of space after demolition. You must return to grade and revegetate. revegetate and he was absolutely correct. So, and I forgot to put this on the table. So the table that I sent out and put online does not have this change, um, but it was an excellent suggestion. I forgot to put this in the table. I made a number of changes to distinguish between two types of demolition projects. One that's demolition and return to grade and one that's demolition to redevelop. Um, we also separated out some of the standards. It's poor practice to put two standards into one standard. So you shall screen and do this. You should have, you got to screen it and you got to do this. Um, so that way the DRB can make determinations on each one of them. And if it gets appealed, we're appealing a very specific thing. Um, so we had some things that were application requirements, like you had to put in your application requirement how you're going to screen everything. But then in your standards, you had no standard for screening. So we took it out of the application requirements. We put it into the into the screening require as a requirement. So we did make a number of adjustments um, at, you know, once spurred by um, Thomas's recommendation, we made a couple of changes. We think much, it comes out much better with the new format. Uh, we have major sign revisions and Mr. Harper came in uh, and he commented about the sign on State Street that he wants to move over. I took a look at that. My estimation is that sign is about 14 feet in height. Uh, the requirement that we have put into the zoning in the proposed zoning is 12 feet. So the sign in question is a little bit too tall. If he moved it, um, I don't think sign area is an issue. Uh, lighting will need to be shielded. The historic light that's in there has these kind of these lantern light things, but certainly on River Street, they're going to have to be shielded. You can't have them. Um, I'm sure there are design ways that they could have a little bit of illumination coming through to kind of have that neat effect, but it would have to be a shielded light. And it's right across from people's houses. So yeah, and so it's going to have to have a certain amount of shielding. Um, so council can keep the recommendation as it is. He would have to shorten the post. Council could increase the height in the regulations to 15 feet, giving everyone that same right. Or council could keep the requirement at 12 feet, but instruct staff to develop some waiver rules. Um, that would allow the DRB to review applications for an additional three feet. Um, yeah, I know he's he was here earlier and he's not, not here now, unfortunately. Um, did did you talk to him about whether he would have an issue with uh, with what you're proposing here, and would it be a problem for him if he if you just told him, well, you got to cut two feet off the bottom of the post to make it? Uh... I didn't get a chance to to meet with him. Okay, we we got. Um, I thought yeah. he, he might be here tonight to kind of go over it, but, um, but anyway, so those would be the three options for kind of going through, uh, you know, I, as I, I think I put in here, um, I'm fine. Staff is fine with any of the suggestions, but would probably lean towards the latter, the waiver option. If you pressed me to go and say, which one would I, I'd probably go with the waiver option. Mm -hmm. The, the only reason for that being that, um, especially for, signs and freestanding signs in the downtown um the design review commission might want to have things at a, a different height might be okay with a 12 foot sign but a 15 foot sign might interfere with you know um, blocking some historic feature so if they had to go to the drb they would you know and but as i said that was a few smaller examples of something like that but again if you moved it to 15 feet i'm fine left it at 12 i'm fine Okay. Um, there was a comment again, uh, Mr. Weiss, about uh, an orphan sign height header. 
Um, good catch. Uh, rather than delete this here, uh, staff went back and moved the measurement that was in G5C back to this place because this section was about how to measure things. So actually that probably should have stayed there. So I moved that back in and left that there. So, um, and there was a question about what happened to figure 316. The requirements that were in 316, this old figure 316 have now been embedded into the text. So that's why the, the figure is no longer needed. And then we've gone through these other policy changes, um, move the boundary line adjustment to be administrative, make permanent interim emergency housing provisions, allow valid permits to have an automatic one-year extension from the date of adoption of these rules. So if we adopt these rules, there'll be an automatic one-year extension to any valid permit. Um, we couldn't just allow every permit because technically once a permit expires, it no longer exists and I can't resurrect it back. Mm -hmm. So we would... It's only permits that are still valid at this time that we could give an automatic one-year extension to. And then they fall under the new rules where they just have to start to commence development. So they don't have to complete their development in one year. They have to commence it. And this, so this automatic one-year extension is really two changes in one, right? One, it has they only have to commence within the period. And two, it gives them an extra year. Yes. Yep. And that goes for everybody else. Um, going forward, we're going to have rules. Once we once you get a zoning approval, you have two years to commence development, and then you'll have two years to complete the project. And usually the reason for that is a lot of projects get their zoning approval, and then if they have to go through Act 250, they might spend 18 months of that two years waiting to get their Act 250 permit. So, um, so there's also a policy recommendation to, uh, and this was from Mr. Weiss, about decreasing the automatic permit exemption for TV dishes. He's, he's right, 15 square feet is awfully big. Um, my recommendation was to is to reduce that to 3.25 square feet, which allows for a two-foot dish. People don't put 15 square foot dishes anymore in their houses. So most of them are, are either two feet or one point something, um, and so... 3.25 would be more than enough to accommodate most standard dishes, and that will probably keep getting smaller as technology improves. Um, fixed uses where residential 24 appears, we've reused that for the urban residential district, which we'll talk about, and fixed top of bank. And I liked Mr. Weiss's suggestion, so I inserted his recommended language for top of bank definition. Um, so I don't know if there are any other policy changes because that leaves us with um, a late request from from BPW on a stormwater request, which I'll go over, which I can go over right now really quickly, which you'll see there. Because we're probably going to have another meeting, this will probably be covered by that anyways. Um, we've been having issues with how DPW handles and administers and runs stormwater reviews. And so they really wanted to get some stuff cleared up. And they've been having their consultant working with them. And so they were like, boy, it'd be great to get some rules changed. And I was like, it's open, get us something right away. So they got us some quick changes. This is not perfect. It's not going to be permanent. We'll come back again in the future to make things a little bit better, but this cleans up a number of pieces that needed to get cleaned up. So other than and could you just, road and solar. You just, you just mentioned briefly what the changes uh, are. For the stormwater? Yeah. Um, so what we don't have right now, in most of our zoning, we have a rule that says if you get the state permit, you don't need the local permit. We don't have that for stormwater. So even if you need a state stormwater permit, you still need to go through a local approval process for the for the state. And it doesn't make a lot of sense. So the first thing you'll see is, so everybody, unless exempted below development that creates new or expanded impervious surface, shall submit a stormwater management plan and receive a recommendation from the Director of Public Works for approval or denial of such plan. Development is exempt from this requirement. So there are two ways, big picture, how you do regulations. You either list out exactly everything you need, this, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. If you don't meet one of those, then you don't have to meet the rule. You can do a small list, or you can say everything is going to need it, and then we're going to go through and exempt out a few things. So there are kind of two approaches. This is everything is going to need to submit a stormwater management plan, and then we're going to exempt a whole bunch of things. One, the development has or will be obtaining a Department of Environmental Conservation general permit for stormwater discharge or an individual stormwater discharge permit as applicable. Those don't need to go and get approval here. 
Two, with in combined sewer areas, the development results in less than 5,000 square feet in total impervious surface on the subject parcel. Now, DPW asked for zero square feet, and we find that's gonna be really difficult. So we put in, based on what we found in, excuse me, St. Albans and other places that have um, impaired watersheds. So um, we have an actual project on Cliff Street right now that is running into this issue, is they've got a house, they've got a driveway, and they're gonna be adding 200 square feet of new impervious surface. They have a huge lot, but because they're in an impaired watershed, because they're in the CSO, they can't have any increase. So they, they couldn't, couldn't add a doghouse to their property because it would increase their... So there's usually a limit. It's like, well, they only have 2,000 square feet of impervious surface on their 19,000 square foot lot. So we need a line that says, if you're less than this, and what is this? In St. Albans Town, in, the, in, in, in these impaired watersheds, it's 5,000 square feet. So we took that number. You could make it 3,000. I don't think it should be zero. We can always come back later. Our thought is we're making things better because right now um, it'll be clearer. Because right now the, the question is how do we handle projects like that? And so if you're an impaired watershed and they said they will get me a map, of which parcels are in the impaired watershed. So we will know who's in, who's out, that has to meet it, two or three. Other, and three is um, 10,000 square feet of impervious surface. So again, you're talking decent size amount of impervious cover, although you might hit that if you lived on a really long driveway and you start adding up the amount of impervious on your driveway. Some places exempt single and two family. The issue I have is I, I'm very, interested in meeting with the stormwater committee and commission once they've got an opportunity because we really need to mesh these together um are single family homes a pro the problem or are they not the problem and if we can always go through and tailor our zoning to match where their goals are i don't think they're there yet so at this point we're going to take our existing zoning make it a little bit better wait for stormwater management committee to catch up and the utility to catch up, and then we'll dovetail our rules with their goals. So this would say if you've got less than 5,000 square feet in a CSO area, you don't need a permit. And if it's less than 10,000 square feet outside of a combined sewer area, then you don't need the permit. So that's what this is um, doing. Most of the rest remains the same of stormwater rules we have in effect. OK, thanks. Um, want to talk about Country Club Road and shading now? I can just jump right in. We'll get everything out of the way and then start taking the public comments on on everything. So yes, the, that's... the two the two big ones. Um, I attached in your um, packet that you have, and if people are online uh, and and have downloaded the version off of the website, that's page two dash thirty. So what we have heard. Um, the Country Club Road rezoning um, proposal. So at the end of the last meeting, we kind of had to figure out what, what direction we wanted to go. I said I would put this all together and you can vote as to whether or not you kind of want to go in this direction. Everything is open to change. Um, I have no pride when it comes to these things. So uh, if, whatever you want to change, I'm putting something out there just so we can start having the conversation. I created a new district. I called it urban residential. You can change the title if you want to. Uh, I added a new purpose statement, uh, neighborhood character, some architectural standards. Most of the architectural standards I just borrowed from the urban area. So that way it kind of matches some of what we have uh, architectural character of the downtown pieces. Uh, I adjusted the dimensional standards to match what was in the actionable plan. And I went through and added a bunch of uses. Now, um, I'll go through that table really quick in a minute. Um, there are a number of permitted, number of conditional. It doesn't necessarily mean we're encouraging um, something like that to happen. Um, I'll, a, a hotel is a conditional use. That's not to say we want one out there. It's just to say that that you know, if if we had a large recreational facility and we were going to be trying to host a lot of events and and things, it you know, somebody might have something small that would fit into the character of that area. 
it's a conditional use. It's a decision that would be made. But if something is not allowed, then it's not allowed. And that's where you end up in, you know, it's like, well, we don't want bars out here. It's like, okay, well, what if three penny wanted to be out there? Well, it's okay if they're out there. It's like, well, that's a bar. <laughs> so those are the things we have to think big. What were the things that might, we might be okay with out, out in this area. Doesn't necessarily mean they'll get an approval. It's just, we're, we're laying out things at this point, big things that kind of go through and say, yeah, that would be okay. In, in certain circumstances, I could see something like that. Okay. Um, but I'll go through what I put in the use table so everyone can understand it. Um, um, so I'm not going to read all this. We would be here for a long time. But I did go through and craft out a, a purpose statement. Remember, purpose statements are not regulatory. So um, putting in here requirements for um, the purpose of this is to have net zero buildings that will add zero requirements to actually be net zero buildings because um, the purpose statement is just there to lay out what are our goals for it. The character of the area, um, the neighborhood character, the reason that is there is to help as we're doing, <clears throat> excuse me, a conditional use hearing, there's a requirement to be built to the character of the neighborhood. So, we want to have some standard that the council can, or that the DRB can use to judge that application. Um, I think I'm not going to go too much into all of this. I'll kind of leave it open to questions. Uh, the dimensional requirements, I had a hard time, didn't know what to do. I put the parcel size at 9,000. That's what Urban Center 2 is. That's... Um, the area from the library to roundabout. Um, so I, I expect the parcels will probably be much bigger than that. But if we decide, hey, we're going to subdivide these and have multiple developers working on multiple projects, maybe they would be 9,000 square feet. Um, but I tried to 80% uh, coverage. So that's similar again to Urban Center 2. Uh, the setbacks I put is 10 feet. Uh, I thought if we wanted urban, we could make them zero for front. That's what urban center one is. We've got zero lot line setbacks here, but 10 feet gives a little bit of space. If we're going to do five story buildings, there's usually an architectural urban design piece that you, you want to move buildings back if you're going to go up higher, because otherwise it gives you a, a tunneled feeling. And I don't think that's what we're looking for there. So if we're going to have taller buildings, a 10 foot setback with some space isn't, isn't a bad idea. 10 feet on the sides. Um, floor area ratio, I put 4.0 max for residential. So if somebody did a congregate living, congregate living is based on floor area ratio. It would be 4.0 and 1.0 for others. So that means you very little for commercial. So if you had some commercial and we could put in requirements that said commercial only on the first floor or, you know, not or non-residential, let's say. So now, what does the floor area ratio mean? I know what all this other stuff means, but all right, that floor, wasn't clear to me. Floor area ratio is um, generally how we regulate commercial uses because you're not counting the number of dwelling units. So what a floor area ratio looks at is the size of your parcel. Let's say you have a 10,000 square foot parcel and you have a floor area ratio of 1.0. You can have 10,000 square feet of uh, use. So you could make it 5,000 square feet and two stories or any combination like that. If you've got a 4.0, then you, you're you going to be looking at a um, much taller building because obviously you can't be four times bigger than your parcel size. You're looking at having multi-story, but it puts a cap on how big things can be. Um, and in this one here, we also put a height minimum of two stories and a height maximum of 60 feet, which is what is in our downtown. So that's five stories, five to six stories. So again, any of this is open to to change or rebuttal, but that's kind of what I put in there. Um, on the use table, it's kind of messy because I also removed a whole bunch of uses, combined a bunch of uses, but really all the uses are permitted all the residential uses are permitted in this district lodging is bed and breakfasts and inns are 
and hotels are all conditional uses. So they would have to go to a hearing. Uh, an emergency shelter would be a permitted use. We've had a conversation about maybe having an emergency shelter if it, because part of this, remember, not half of this of the Country Club Road site is currently set aside for a recreation or um, a center. And we've talked about potentially building an emergency shelter with whatever recreational facility goes there. So if we did, it would be a permitted use. That doesn't commit us to doing it. This is just saying it's allowed. Um, commercial retail sales up to 20,000 square feet is a conditional use. So again, I'm not expecting things out there, but at the same time, a commercial use could be any number of things. And we really don't want to box ourselves in to say something can't happen. Um, so retail sales, like, like we said, could be a lot of, could be a small grocery store. Yeah. Off the top of your head, can you give us an example of a commercial property in in the city that's around 20,000 feet? Uh, that, that's where the cutoff is. So um, 20,000 square feet is pretty big, but in our zoning, we have two classifications. We have retail sales up to 20,000 square feet and retail sales bigger than 20,000 square feet. So um, this just happens to be that use category is, okay. is that. Um, we could put in some language that says, put a, put a one or you know, put a footnote that says anything more than Hmm. Looks I like we just got, got booted. Off. Just got booted out. Yeah, I think. I think yeah. the yeah the the power flicker probably was the power going out. Okay, let's take our break. While we... <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we're ready to start up again. And and Pella and I see that you're you're connected. So thumbs up. Okay, excellent. All right. So sorry, folks, for the interruption, but we're. We're back in business. All right. So um, we're Mike looking Miller. at the use tables, right? Yep. Mike okay. Miller, uh, planning director. So we're just wrapping up the use tables. Then I think we'll um, move into taking some comments, I would guess. Um, so continuing, uh, the last comment that was in was just about the retail sales indoor up to 20,000 square feet. That's what's in um the new zoning so that's the use category we can always limit it we can always put an asterisk if we want to and or a, a, a number and put a thing at the end to limit that again i'm not expecting anything that big but again if you don't say retail sales and you want to have a corner grocery store you can't and it's conditional anyway and it's conditional anyway so mm -hmm. you've got a lot of flexibility to say no and the city also owns the property, so we've got a lot of control over what happens going forward. I think for reference, the existing Elks Club building is 14,000, isn't it? Sounds about right. Yeah. So to get, that would be a good size store, yeah. Yeah, I, I wouldn't expect anything as big as 20,000 square feet. I would say, I would think 20,000 is probably about the size of Shaw's. Maybe. I think that's more like 14. I think that's only 14 too? Okay. Hmm. Yeah. So we can always always also change that that use altogether because that was splitting retail sales in the past had just been, this goes back to the original thing. We've made a number of changes just to the use table. And one of the changes was to kind of collapse and combine a few things. And before we had a mall and we had retail so if you had more than one shop, then you were a mall and you had to meet the, all these requirements. Even if it was just two people cohabitating in one space, you technically qualify as a mall. So we were like, look, it's really all about your square foot footprint. Um, so we can also go through and say up to 10,000 square feet is the small retail and more than 10,000 is the big retail. And maybe that's a better cutoff. And we can talk about that afterwards. Um, so we did um, in the use table, uh, a bank was conditional. I mean, again, this is this is an area that could potentially have 500 people. Maybe there's a, an ATM or a small something that's potential. Personal, professional services, that could be any number of, of small things that if somebody wanted to have a, a small yoga studio or something like that, you could have those types of uses. Um, restaurant, restaurant, takeout, 
bar nightclub again i think i commented on you know these are all small things that do we expect this to be downtown montpelier no do we expect to have some opportunities for little things um you know going out and, and grabbing a burger and grabbing a beer um might not be bad uh painting studio just matched up with some other things i did not put any manufacturing or any of the industrial uses out there Uh, we did, I did put as conditional, a lot of the public assemblies. So I don't know again, what the direction of where this may go in the future, but performance theaters, movie theaters, amphitheaters, small game facilities that was actually talked about, you know, maybe they do indoor golf sports arena, um, exhibition conference. Again, I don't know what's going to happen on the, on the city's piece. Uh, religious facilities, government facilities, other community centers. We've talked about a community center, fitness, gym, athletic. We're already talking about that on the city's portion. Um, did not allow golf courses up there, by the way. <laughs> Just to be clear. Uh, camps and camping uh, establishments, I did not allow. Uh, nature parks, we um, I left it permitted. It's permitted in every district and recreation fields are also permitted. Uh, I did allow a uh, health clinic as a conditional. There's been discussions about uh, maybe co-locating. Um, it's been done in a lot of other areas. Um, sometimes they'll have a health facility with uh, either a senior facility. You might have a rehab center that might be located in a part of a floor near uh, a senior living facility. Or because this is a recreational facility, it might be located there as well. Again, it's conditional use. We own the property. It just is making it possible. And we can change this use table in the future once we have a better idea as well. Museum, uh, public safety or you know, libraries, cemetery is still in there, conditional because it matched with the urban areas. Daycare center is a permitted use. Surface parking, uh, parking structure, bus stop, those are all permitted. Uh, utility structure is permitted. That's just generally in every district. Agriculture, forestry, and rural enterprise, because agriculture is allowed in every district and rural enterprise is conditional in every district. So again, I put the use table together as a starting point to start having the conversation. Um, I'm not wedded to anything, um, but that's what I put together for our starting point to discuss Country Club Road. I guess I'll turn it back over to the mayor. All right. Well, since this is the entire zoning uh, package, I will open it up to public comment. See if there's anybody in the room who has comments to make, and then we can go from there to people online. Mr. Weiss, do you have comments? Let's start the stopwatch. Uh, Thomas Weiss again. Uh, thank you for holding this hearing. Um, I'm going to start out with my years of experience of reviewing and administrating contracts for engineering services and construction have gone into uh, the review and the comments I made last time and this time. Um, and my comments, I'm going to talk about the urban residential district and limit it to the table of uses. Uh, you might want to allow water supply related facility in that district. Um, I can foresee the potential of needing perhaps a small water storage tank in there. I'm not sure what the hydraulics of your water system are and whether that amount of use can be supplied uh, coming off Route 2 or not a small pump station down on Route 2 and, and then a water storage tank. I mean, the other alternative would be to try and connect something up to the water st storage tank off Easy Street. Um, and I that wouldn't be very effective to me to pump it all the way up to run it all the way back down. That's a long um, pipe run. Or a new pipe down Sherwood Drive, which would be really expensive. Um, 
Greenhouses is part of a large community garden space. Greenhouses, I believe, are not permitted in the district. Um, I can foresee if we're going to have that many uh, it, units with a large number of apartments, having some kind of a larger community garden space than is allowed uh, in the whatever the plan is that was came out June of last year. Uh, they only have a really small one. Well, uh, I appreciate the other uses that were excluded from the table of uses uh, that, that Mike did. I, I appreciate the, the way he set it up. I might have done it a little differently, but it's good. And the last one, going back to last week, I do ask that you retain the solar access part and leave it into the in, in the bylaws. So those are my comments. Good. Okay. Great. It makes up for last week. Thank, thank you. And I do appreciate the uh, detail and the time you took to go through all this stuff because none of us are perfect. All right. Looking online, looks like Nathan Souter, you're up first. And you'll have to pause while you're allowed to. Oh, there you go. Um, City Council, thank you for your service. Mike Miller, thank you for all the work you all have done. Um, I've been not as attentive to City Council stuff, but I'm quite interested in the zoning discussion, and so thank you for having it. <clears throat> um, I would, listening to tonight, I would include non-conforming parcels in language, uh, you know, let's be... I think as permissive as possible. If we if we actually want housing, let's take action that leads to more housing, or or at least lowers all the barriers or as many barriers as possible. Uh, I would like to see expanding the ARP recommendation of no density uh, max to further districts, not you know not just the downtown. Um, ARP I think is taking that position for a good reason, and residential fifteen, residential three thousand. Residential six, why not? Let's see what happens. Wouldn't it be great if we got some new housing? Um, <laughs> I heard somebody say, well, you know, we did this in 2018 and it hasn't been an issue since. And what that meant when they said it was, it hasn't been an issue means we haven't built any housing. Uh, so uh, let's, let's be less cautious and get more housing. Um, and then I know that in response to the Home Act, you're moving from duplexes to quads. Uh, why not make it six, right? Why not get ahead of the curve? Um, you know what? That's a that's a, a a third story on top of a second story instead of just you know or or whatever. Um, if <clears throat> if someone actually has the the resources and the will to build new housing, the math is going to be way better on a six than a four. Um, so from a, you know, from someone trying to actually put this into action and build something new or renovate, you know, the even the work of renting one, renovating one of our large buildings into uh, four units or six units, it's it's a fair amount of work. It's a lot of investment. So let's let's allow it to be uh, viable financially. Um, I think that's pretty much what I got. Um, please, please push, push hard. And let's see if we can create some housing. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Is there anyone else who's participating on online who would like to be heard? Okay. I'm not seeing any hands up. So with that, I will close the public hearing. And uh, Mike, could you give us a reaction to some of the comments we just heard? Uh, all right. So Thomas's uh, three recommendations that I got, I didn't um, pick whether they were um, conditional or permitted, but I think they all make sense. Uh, I think there likely is going to be water supply and and probably not a sewer related facility, but it still doesn't hurt. They're all operated by the city. We could make them permitted or conditional uses. It's probably not a big risk there. Uh, greenhouses, 
we can make them either permitted or con conditional if you want to add those into the table. Um, so if you want, I can put a permitted for all three of those. Yeah, definitely, definitely for water and sewer and greenhouses. Why not? You have it permitted to have greenhouses. I've visualized a lot of gardens up there, but greenhouses are again a structure. So let's say we have some clustered housing that turns out to be and forms an association within their housing, and the association wants to do something. Can they say no greenhouses, even though it's permitted? It's not doesn't have to be allowed. It will really be a conflict potentially with an association's ruling and something like this. If it's so, I guess the best example, um, the the condos up on Main Street, uh, right. Murray Hill. Thank you. It's getting late, but the idea is it, they are in they're in a zoning district, and they have more they have stricter rules in there that they set for themselves that are stricter than the zoning. So yes, the answer is they could they they could regulate. So if but in this case the city owns this property, so we have the ability to decide what conditions would get put on it. Now if we sold it to somebody, just if we just subdivided and sold it and said we're we're doing gonna just. Um, not put additional conditions on it, then they could turn around and condoize it and put restrictions on it. Um, these greenhouses that we're talking about here are commercial greenhouses. These, this is a table of uses, so it's not necessarily the the structure. It's it always gets confusing, and even planners conflate them all the time. You'll you'll sometimes see in here like a you know a garage, like a you know, repair garage. It's like well, it's you know it's the structure, it's not the use. Uh, th this is a use table, not the structure. The garage is the building that the use is going on in. And so a greenhouse is it's kind of lends itself to thinking about the greenhouse as the structure. But if, if you're just a resident, if you're just residentially owning a greenhouse because you like to grow your own food, that's not regulated here as a use. It's the commercial greenhouses. So that probably should be more of a commercial or a conditional and a permitted use. Uh, we have a Comment from the back. Yes, Thomas Weiss again. I would like to clarify that when I said greenhouse, I meant small ones that individuals might put up on their own little garden plot. I was not thinking of it in the terms that Mike just mm -hmm. mentioned it. So, and I was thinking a large commercial greenhouse would not be appropriate for my yeah. concept of what that district would be. Gotcha. So that would be more, those greenhouses you're thinking about are more like the standard we have now for a shed where you can, as long as it's no more than, what is it, 10 feet or 8 feet high? and uh, yeah, You can, you can go feet. bigger than that, but it's, yeah, there are certain exemptions. If you're less than that, then you don't need a permit at all. And if right. you're more than that, then you need a permit, but you'll need to meet a setback requirement. So if you're going to yeah. have a, you know, maybe a, a 20 by 20 greenhouse, you could do it. You just got to be meet the setback in that district. Okay. So, um, yeah. So I just I changed that one to conditional. The other ones are permitted. Uh, and the comments from uh, Mr. Souter. Um, again, we talked about the non-conforming for three zero zero two. That's an option. You guys can remove that if you if you choose. Um, expand ARP to more districts. This has been in, uh, we've been. At the planning commission and the planning department, we've been trying to be a little bit cautious about taking incremental steps. We made the big leap in 2018. And since then, we've been trying to just take some incremental steps because there have been a lot of comments and concerns in the community. We haven't heard a lot of them tonight, but um, in past meetings, um, Jack has certainly been here and we've had folks have come in. So our, we've been trying to be very deliberate to make sure that we don't overstep things and get ourselves into a bad position. So AARP was pretty clear about, you know, as long as you've got good design rules, you don't need to have um, density requirements. And we have not yet made this proposal to simply go through and say, if you're in the design review district, you don't have to go through and have density requirements applied. and 
it seemed to match up very well with the recommendations that we had. And we think it's the, it's the next logical step. If you, if you talk to planners, we will tell you density is really a misnomer. People get hung up on it, but if the community is not ready for it and not ready to accept it, then we're, we're not going to be successful. So we have to take this a step at a time. So we like this next step. It's a significant increase in the size of the area. Right now it's the urban one, two, and three that don't have density. And we're going to significantly increase that to some residential neighborhoods and up the hill. Um, and we'll see how that goes. So, uh, if you if you take away the density requirement because of the uh, design regulations, how does that affect the the applicant? Do they how do they get sort of a preliminary indication of what's possible? How much work have they got to do before they sort of feel like they're safe to proceed with the expensive part of their you know prep prep work? So it would go in a lot the same way that we do for our downtown projects. Uh, if somebody came in and was like, you know, we're looking to do a redevelopment. We're trying to understand what the rules are, what we can do. And the first thing we say, all right, density doesn't matter. It's whatever you can build within the box that you can build. So we're going to give you setbacks. We're going to give you height. We're going to give you bulk and massing. We're going to give you um, lot coverage requirements. You're still going to have parking requirements in some of these. In urban center one, two, and three, you don't have parking requirements. But if you're up at National Life, you will have a parking requirement. Um, so they're going to be limited by certain other design requirements and architectural requirements. They can't just build whatever they want, but certainly if you've got, and it makes a big difference, especially with existing buildings, you've got much more flexibility to look at a, a space and go through and say, does it make sense to have X number of studios or, you know, as, as I said, you can do eight single unit, single studio units, or I can do four, two bedrooms. Um, so it's a conversation. It's not a, a big roll of plants. Um, yeah, there's yeah. less of less going in. I mean, um, you know, Mr. Kelman isn't here, but he would certainly go in and say, you know, he had, he had project ideas that he had that it was the density itself that was the barrier. And you're just like, well, you know, if, if he were in one of these areas and had land in that, then the density isn't the issue. He still has to meet the parking requirements and he still has to meet these other requirements if that's required in that mm -hmm. district. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, and then the last comment, why not six instead of four? Again, this just goes to our incremental stepping approach. Um, you know, if the, if the, I think if the planning commission were, were king for a day, they would just go through and say, we're not going to have density requirements in the city at all. And we're just going to go to, regulating through bulk and massing and doing all that. But the reality is uh, the public isn't ready for that. And as we made the changes in 2018, the sky didn't fall. And those were significant changes. Those were big changes to, to our zoning. Um, it really in, increased the density in those districts, even though really just matched the zoning to what's on the ground. And then we've increased those opportunities since then. And with each step, we haven't had the catastrophic outcomes that some people had been concerned about. So we're looking at this. We'd like to go from two to four. If four is great, and in a couple of years, everyone says, hey, this has been a really great thing. It's resulted in a lot of good infill, and it's had good results. And here are the bad results. We had these two bad cases. Then we can go through and address, all right, if we're going to change this, let's make sure that doesn't happen again. Let's make sure these more opportunities are created. And so we're just trying to take it a step at a time. And just to be clear for people who are listening, when you we are talking about the conversations talking about density requirements, what we're really talking about is density limits, right? Yes, density limits, correct. Mm -hmm. um, Sal, did you want to follow up on that? Oh, go ahead. Well, I see Nathan Souter has his hand up and I, I we, the public hearing is done, but let's get you in anyway. And Tim, you want to be heard too. So, yeah. Um, thank you. And I, I don't wish to trample on your protocol. Um, my only thought is, you know, I don't know how much housing has been created since 2018. I don't think it's been a lot. Um, the amount of time I think it would take for anybody to plan something, permit it, and get it done for us to see Oh, that hold on a second. Um, to see 
oh, we we relaxed our rules too far. We have these three really bad results, ugly buildings that happen to be housing a bunch of people. You know, uh, if we keep, in, you know, if we're sort of taking this asymptotic curve to that to that line, wherever that line is, I'm not <laughs> sure. I'm not sure we're going to find it. I'd like to sort of let's let's find out. There's so many so many natural controls right now in terms of the cost of building to creating any housing at all. Um, and if you know, I mean, I, Mike, I was on that call. You had a listing session for the planning commission, and I was on that call and said, "Look, I've got a I bought, I just bought a duplex. It's got a huge third floor. I would love to be able to add two units to that third floor." Getting you know getting this to four to four units, I think will make that possible. Um, but I can certainly I can I can see buildings in town where allowing six would make the math a lot better. And it I think for most people, unless you just have loads of cash and a long long timeline, it's it's got to pencil out. And so if if six units is a way better math than four, please allow that. Anyway, thank you very much. Lots of respect for you all. Thanks. Tim, since you're on this issue, I think let's. Yeah, I am. Actually, I just going to say a lot of things that Nathan just said, but and I, to carry it a little further, I I agree with them. I, I think based on my experience with it, and our own home is when we converted from a single to a two. Um, there's a lot more steps to this in regulations than just the initial piece. So, and I know several people that have gone and wanted to do auxiliary apartments and just become so frustrated that they just didn't do them. Um, so I, I do think opening it up and because we, we really haven't created the housing we want to create, we really need to uh, create those opportunities. Um, I, I would go to a higher number and I know we're being safe and trying to do it incrementally, but housing is a crisis right now. I, and I really think we need to step out a little on this one. Donna. So I wanted to talk about the density. If indeed we have all these other criteria in all the districts, I don't think we're allowing anything to happen. What would it take now to send this back to the commission? I mean, did the commission really hear from so many people about density that they still think it's, I know it used to be, I was here when we went through it before and people did show up loud and clear, but the housing crisis has changed in temperament. The community is really on board with housing. What would it take to? I think if you went through and wanted to vote tonight to go through, and, and I can help tick through a number of these things, um, removing the non-conforming from that, you know, the you, you have to have a conforming lot. We can remove that piece. There are a number of things we could go through and you could add in. And just send it back to the planning commission. I can almost, I can almost guarantee that the planning commission is going to support it and send you back a letter of support that says, "Yeah, we support this." We've tried to, you know, I think we're the planning commission and the staff have tried to be respectful to all the viewpoints because we we we've heard these before and we've recommended removing density from the riverfront district and that got voted down and then we recommended uh residential 1500 and that got voted down and then we've recommended so we've we've made a number of proposals to try to make these small changes and they all got voted down and so we were like all right here's our next shot we're going to do design control and that's going to be our push if city council says design control is not enough i know the planning commission would support having more districts or more rules to make things more flexible they chose the two they felt that had the best evidence of support we we went from we said you could put a duplex regardless of density and the sky didn't fall and there were a lot of people who were concerned about it so our thought was i think we can get through four because it, it it's just everybody knows it's a crisis. We should be able to do this. It, it shouldn't be a big issue. And for people who were concerned, the concern we heard was we're going to reach a point where there's uh, an incentive for people to come in and buy up houses or buy up two houses, bulldoze the houses, and come in and put in this giant monstrosity that really doesn't match the character of our downtown. So we tried to address the, design, the demolition rules. We did. We put the demolition rules in. Again, I'm, we're trying to respond to what the comments were that we heard and we're going to propose this for this district so we were trying to come back with a proposal if council wants to go through and say that's you're not the planning commission isn't going far enough trust me the planning commission will support you if you say change the number to this change the number to this change the number to this and i'll send it back to the planning commission and we'll get basically a vote of confidence to come back to you at the next meeting 
Tim. So if you expanded it from design control, which zones would be the next zones to expand it to? Are you thinking all or spe some specific? Did Nathan say six, nine, and 15? He, uh, I believe he said 1,500, 3,006, six, res six. So um, the residential 1,500 and residential 3,000 for people who just hear numbers and don't know where we're talking about, these are really the most downtown uh, neighborhood. So residential 1500, I think you'd be talking about St. Paul street. Um, if you're right in the downtown, it's a, you know, a small section. I think it might have a part of Loomis and then it goes to three. I think actually, I think three Loomis is three, uh, Liberty's a little bit of three. And then you start getting up into the sixes that are kind of in, um, some of the, the other surrounding ones you're, uh, so I think, a college is red six uh, college street. Uh, so when you're saying 1500, three, six, just for people, does that mean 1500 square feet of land per unit in the R1500 and yes. 3000 square feet of land per unit and R3000? That's what that means. Yeah. 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 And, and for the most part, that's what is already there right. um, for res 3000, the minimum lot size or for res 1500, the lot size minimum is still 3000, but almost everything in that district is at least a duplex. That's why it's allowed to have twice the density. And your res nine, which hasn't been mentioned are really more of your uh, outside ones um, heading up Terrace Street, heading out Northfield Street, um, Independence Green out that way. And uh, Heading out Berlin Street, as you start getting out, you'll get out to Res Nine as you are. Um, yeah, Berlin Berlin Street. Yeah. So, those are your Res Nines. They they tend to be more single family, but again, they are allowed to be duplexes under the current rules. So just to get a feel for what people are thinking, do you want to be aggressive and not ask Mike to do that or? Not so much. Just general impression. I'm seeing nods over here. Yes. Carrie, all right. And Pellin, is that your feeling too? Okay. There's there's some. It's it's not a decision, but it's guidance to come back with that. Well, we'll probably have to have you guys vote on making a change to the draft. Okay. And that is what the planning commission will then decide on. So we'll probably go through. So first question, removing the non-conforming. Right now we only allow this for conforming and we only allow this, and I don't know if we want to break that into two things, it's conforming with water and sewer. Do we want to remove all of those requirements or do we want to remove the non-conforming? Anyone? I, my quick reaction would be remove non-conforming as long as it has water and sewer. I think if you don't have... Don't worry about not having yeah. water. Yeah, there are the... Op Any big problems associated with that? Yeah, there are external problems that, that can be caused, yeah. All right, so we'll remove the non-conforming, which is currently for allowing people to do a duplex. We've proposed four units, and you are suggesting we make that six? Yep. I, I'm saying yes. I don't have a vote, obviously. <laughs> I was looking. I was counting but, and shaking yeah. heads. So, um, uh, trying to think if there were where would be the next. Uh, unless you guys are looking at expanding districts, so we are currently talking about the design review district, which also encompasses the downtown. So what used to be just urban one, two, and three, they're already in the design control. They're now gonna to continue to be in the design control. The next highest density ones, I don't know for a fact that all the 1500s are in design control, but probably most of them are. I'd, I'd have to have the map open in front of me and I don't actually, didn't actually bring a copy of the map or riverfront, which would be Berry Street in those areas, um, if you were looking at that. I, I think I would have a little bit of concern about just picking districts without 
actually having some time to think about it and taking some public comment on that. I think regardless, if somebody has a small project, and again, our point was to allow these smaller infill projects to happen. That was why we allowed, take a single family, you can have a two, you can have a four, you can have a six. Nobody's going to go down and bulldoze a house or bulldoze two houses to build six units. They, you know, they, you know, they might if it's a, a low value, a low value structure, but nobody's going in. Your the density would still apply for these larger buildings. Um, and again, that just goes back to a little bit of taking this a little incrementally. This will be a big step to go from two to six, and removing that requirement. If you want to add zoning districts, you're certainly welcome to. Um, there have been comments in the past. I will only mention this. Um, some folks aren't here that would certainly have mentioned it. Um, the parking requirement can become a barrier to some of these. Uh, we don't have any proposals in here to amend the parking requirements, but that's kind of a double-edged sword for some lower income neighborhoods that, that have parking issues. So um that would be another one but i think i think if we made those changes there's no density in the design review which is a, a fairly large area and uh increasing those to six um if you're on water and sewer and you have a con and uh, if you're on water and sewer and we're removing the non-conforming requirement lauren you had your hand up yeah i was just thinking um perhaps the planning commission, like you taking some time in the planning commission, um, you could see if there's like a next obvious place to expand. I do think like probably we'd want robust time for public comment if we're expanding into new areas. So that might mean like maybe two more hearings. So just to be cognizant, I mean, it could be that there's a next phase of this and we, you know, like clearly I think you're hearing a sense that you know, we, I, we I, need to be doing more on housing. Yeah, with, our, with our timing, I might suggest we move forward and adopt these rules. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking is like you round. could come back with another round of recommendations. Like maybe we move forward with these, the kinds of things we're talking about tonight and the planning commission could think about a next phase of changes moving in this direction as yeah. well or something. Yeah, they're always thinking about how to to make the next steps in, in keep continuing to loosen up the rules. Um, because we know we're also going to be back to talk about the, the, um, stormwater rules. We're pretty sure that there's going to be something coming back because this was this was an imperfect fix, but it's a necessary fix. It's a good next steps fix. But at a certain point, we're going to have to have a more comprehensive um, work on that. So we'll, we will certainly be back. Usually for anyone new to the council, we're usually here about once a year to do a zoning update. So um, we've done two in one year once, but usually we try to come back at least once a year because we'll build up a list of mistakes that we find. But if we do this with some of the expansions that we've talked about, that will include the country club road zoning, which was sort of driving some of the timing because we need to get the zoning done before we can do the, uh, yeah, we the need that step. done before we can do growth center application. So we yep. have to, we have to get that approved. Um, again, we waiting till March to, to do this isn't a big deal. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't want to hold a bunch more public hearings. Um, Donna. So what exactly do you need in a motion? So you could leave here and take it back to the planning commission. We have one more hearing. I would say the motion would need to be that you want to... Uh, let's, cause you're not going to adopt it. You're going to want to approve the public hearing draft number two as presented with the following or with the amendments that were made either or if you want, I don't know if John wants those specifically laid out. The ones I have on my list are, uh, the changes that the three changes to the use table um the removal of non-conforming requirement in section 3002 and to go from quad to six go from quad to six um and those are the changes that i have written down 
Thank if you. anyone remembers anything I missed, let me know. I think those were the only ones I have on my list. Well, there there are other things that we talked about that we should go through your checklist to to make decisions on before we're ready to vote the package as a whole. So I don't know if you want to, if Donna, if you want to make a motion on this particular part. The changes we wanted the commission needed to look at or the other sort of comments that we've, we've received also issues that the commission needs to look at. Or is it just well, these the, three? I'll, I will have them review all the changes that were made. If it's going back to them, I'll give them a list of all the changes that were made. If for no other reason, it helps to dot the I and cross the T on any, making sure there's no appeal afterwards that we didn't follow proper procedure on a substantial change. Well, if everything goes back, we'll have them review everything and go through and say, yeah, we're okay with all of these small changes that were made, even if they were technical changes. But for the motion, as far as the commission, is it making a motion to to do the three changes on the table, remove non-conformance, and go from four to six units? Are those the key ones that they need to hear us approve? So, I, yeah, it's there, not, there, there, still more, there are a couple of yeah. ways of getting there. I'm thinking in my head, there are a couple of routes of getting there. One is to go through and, and vote those three changes and amend the draft you have in front of you. Let's vote to amend this, let's vote to amend this, or let's vote to amend these three or four things into this, and then you guys approve this draft for a hearing on March 13th. We're going to continue a hearing to March 13th, and that and then the planning commission will have to review those changes. And there's still other things that we've talked about that are not covered by this motion that we still need to figure out what we want to do. Yeah, and if we want to, we can do all those changes before making that final motion, or we can do this piecemeal. Why don't we do that? Why don't we go back to the beginning? Yeah, so. Well, we might want to include solar shading here, right? I mean, if we're talking about going four to six and people build up, it could be, it could have a bearing. Yeah, we still have the question of solar shading, which we haven't really dove into yet. Okay. Discuss Country Club Road. Right. Right, we're still not there in Country Club Road, I don't think. So, what I, do you want to talk about Country Club Road before I go back to the beginning of uh, Mike's uh, checklist? All right, let's do that. What do people think about the Country Club Road proposal? Anybody? Kim, do you have something? Well, it, it's still to, based on I, I, kind of looking at the map. It feels like we're just zoning this piece because it's our piece. But really, if we're looking at creating housing and looking at Montpelier zoning and what's right for the community, it seems like there are other people, pieces of land nearby that are big that are also in Montpelier that we would want to create potential for housing on. Why aren't we adjusting the zoning or a zone to get it right? rather than just doing this kind of one knee-jerk thing for this one property because we bought it and we really do something with it. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, I think Steve Rivellini would have done something with it if the zoning had allowed the use or any other private person might have in the past. But as we know, the zoning wouldn't really allow what we want to have happen there. And it's still the same issue for some abutting properties. So I would encourage going back to Planning Commission and looking at a bigger picture and saying, what about some of the other abutting pieces? If we're creating this new zone, shouldn't it encompass part of Asia Golden property or Zorzi Golden property? Or, you know, even going the other way toward Town Hill. There's a fair amount of potential land there that could be housing. We have heard from, we we know that there's, yeah. uh, there are notions of development on uh, the Sabin's pasture. We've heard from and a budding property owner to the north who said, well, yeah, I might be interested. They didn't really yeah. say, here's what I want to do. But how, how does that strike you, Mike? Uh, I set this district up as a district with a general purpose statement and some, and this as a neighborhood. So the expectation was if this works out well, it could be an opportunity for people to come in and talk about rezoning uh, another parcel, but we haven't had that conversation um, with other ones. The concern with Saban's pasture, uh, it's always a very hot button issue. 
we did rezone that one uh, after a lot of conversation and it's zoned to match what is um, on Berry Street. So it is the same zoning as Berry Street. So that's one unit per 1500. So that's 27 units an acre. And because it was 10 acres, they could fit so or 15 acres of the lower area, 15 acres of the lower area that zoned that. So it, it could hit some three to 400 units down there. So that's riverfront? Is that what? That's the zoned riverfront. And then the rest of it's all rural. The you? rest of it was rural because it doesn't have access to sewer and water at this time. And the thought is if there's a plan at some point, we would certainly rezone it. And in the same way that we have put a res 3000 at the top of ours, it's it's not there yet. Sewer is not there, but there's a plan in place that says we would run the sewer and water up here. And I think I would expect we would come back if there's a savings pasture proposal, or if we came up with a proposal that said, Hey, we're going to connect this road across. We wouldn't connect that road across through a zoned rural area. It may be rural in a spot because it's not developable, but where it starts to become developable and where there's sewer and water, we certainly would want to see development have that zoned in such a way that it would encourage development. Donna. Well, in response to that, when we were changing that for Savings Pasture, we also had Vermont College there, and they were talking about senior housing. And we left that rural area because Zorzi was going to be looking at a land trust deal and a shared open public area on top. And so we really were trying to work with the landowners, both at the Vermont College and with Savings Pasture. And I think it was totally appropriate um, Likewise, I think it's totally appropriate for us to, to do Country Club Road tonight and then in the future put forth to the commission the tasks that Tim is talking about and looking at the other areas. I think it's late in the game to add that now. That's I, all. I, I, sorry. I, Go ahead. Late yeah. in the game? I mean, this is really the first substantive conversation we've had about zoning, Donna. It's, it's the beginning of the game, I think. Well, I thought we had directed them to do something for Country Code Road. And that's what they did. Maybe you did before I was on the council. I don't remember. Um, any other council members? Or at this point, uh, Joe, you've got your hand up. Thanks, Jack. Can you, can you guys hear me? Yes. Let's start out by introducing yourself. Yeah. Uh, Joe Castellano, Saving Street, Montpelier. Um. I was actually reviewing the appraisal report that authorized the purchase of the country club property. And I was reading what the appraiser's analysis was. Currently it's zoned for rural and Eastern gateway. And he said that given the current zoning, we can do up to 230 units, 238 units of housing. And I know that the proposal we're looking at from White and Burke has just slightly more than that at 294 units. I'm just wondering if maybe Mike has tweaked zoning in the past rather than doing a whole new district. Can we maybe tweak the zoning or the boundary lines to accommodate more density up there? I'm I'm just throwing an idea out there. Thanks. So the existing zoning for, for the Country Club Road site, so the Country Club Road site isn't uniformly all zoned rural right now. The lower five-ish acres, right where the country club is, right where the parking lots are, those areas are zoned Eastern Gateway, which is, you know, you're thinking uh, Gallison Hill, the industrial areas, you're thinking um, those types of uses, uh, tractor supply. So Route 302 and Route 2, basically. Um, so yes, we could, you know, it's, it had a certain amount of development potential because of its size. You could do um, some development, some PUDs, and cluster things down. But it really wasn't going to give us an, an effective way of enticing a developer running lines up there. Uh, the truth is, if you're going to run sewer and water in there, then it should get it should get rezoned to an appropriate zoning designation as opposed to um, necessarily kind of tweaking around the edges because we're really not going to be using it in the for that eastern gateway type use. Mm -hmm. Um, if it was, we, I probably would have suggested we just expand Eastern Gateway, but um, because it's going to be a completely different use, um, it makes sense to be a, a different district. All right. Okay. Anyone else on the council with the um, 
Kim, do you have any other specific comments about the uh, the new urban residential proposal, or is it more a general idea that it should be expanded? I think it needs to be expanded. Okay. Um, Lauren. Thanks. Um, when, I think this is a question for Mike, when you were describing this a lot over and over again, you were kind of like, well, I'm putting this in, but we've got control of the site. So we'd have a say of what goes in. If we expanded this to a bunch of other properties that were privately owned, we would not have that control. So it sounds like maybe you would have, you would write it differently if we were trying to create a broader, um, new district in town or, or am I just over interpreting what you're saying? I just, I just heard I think, you say that phrase a lot. <laughs> yeah. No, I think, I think I would, we would probably want to not necessarily, and, and it, it, it could be a little bit on both sides. I mean, it could be, do we need to adjust the urban residential or do we need to, you know, uh, consider how we do it? You know, let's say the, the, pro the proposal was rather than making lower savings pasture riverfront, maybe we should make that urban residential. It'll have more flexibility to do things. And then I think we would have to have that discussion of, well, if we make that change, that's going to allow these other uses. So we could then adjust the use table or we can say it's really not appropriate the way we have it zoned now is the most appropriate way. And I think we just have, have to have a public conversation about that. But I do think, I do want to make this available such that it could be potentially applied. And I was trying to think when I was putting this together, where might this kind of fit? And I, and I couldn't find anywhere, but that's not to say that we couldn't come up with a place where it might be, probably won't be as big as what we're talking about, but there might be something that comes up at some point that's a smaller version of that. That's like, you know, here's here's an area that, um, you know, something about Route 302, you know, uh, if there's an area in there. I don't, I don't know. I'm trying to think. I, I really can't think of anything that really would fit because we're so built out or floodplain. You know, there's just so much, so many other restrictions out there. But we might rezone something else that we currently have zoned. Um, res 1500, and we might say, hey, let's make this urban residential or something. So you're definitely thinking as you drafted what urban residential means that it's not isolated to this parcel, or it could be, it's a model that could apply to other, other parts of the city. Yeah, I tried to make it broad enough because it's a district uh the neighborhood we want to be specific to the to the country club road site but the district itself should be written in such a way that it could apply somewhere else uh, and i as i said i can't think of any place that it would fall into but you never know somebody might have an have an idea well there's adjacent land to our parcel that <laughs> oh oh you mean own. oh onto the the piece that's owned by um steve right next door yeah um yeah, we the, the property line. Yeah, the property lines in there have been tricky, but we could. Yeah, we certainly could look at some of those. We didn't in this in this instant, mm -hmm. but um, there's some topography challenges on that other site. But um, we should we should look at what rezoning that would do. And we don't know what the owner wants to do with that. So, all. Right. Joe, do you have your hand still up or okay? I'll very quickly. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yep. Perfect. Yeah, I know that uh one of the things that Mike and I have been discussing back and forth via email is I know that there's going to be a brand new master plan that's going to be coming out soon. And my thought was, okay, would some of the rezoning that Tim had brought up would this better fit under doing the new master plan or under the master plan umbrella? There's just a question. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I think they all should just in yeah. the true spirit of a master plan. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, is there anything else that uh, are people 
in general will it ready to say yes let's add this uh urban residential as proposed to the uh to the ordinance figure we'll make a motion at the end but general nods or lauren yeah i, I mean i support doing this i know there's like timeliness around moving this forward so we can keep the country club project moving forward. I do think this broader conversation and look, and I mean, I know you said you generally try to do once a year. I mean, given the housing urgency and this, you know, the master planning process and all that, like maybe we just want to be looking at more proposals sooner, um, knowing that there's a lot more we want to be doing on this. Um, and it seems like there's some kind of logical next steps that would just build on what we're doing um, right now that we could, we wouldn't necessarily have to wait a year. So I just, I kind of, that's what I would like to see. Yeah, I like that. All right, uh, Donna. So that was also saying then move on these now, but then continue to keep moving on things. Yes. Quickly, yeah. Yeah. I mm -hmm. um, all right, what about solar? We haven't had any discussion, real discussion about that, Sal. Uh, I brought it up because... Um, the energy committee had a discussion about it with with mike president mike presented the uh the 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 new zoning proposes to eliminate entirely the solar access and shading provision so we had some discussion of you know why it was originally in there and you know whether or not it should be uh kept or modified somehow um i mean it seems obvious that it was in there to try and um protect and incentivize people to um, to use, you know, s solar energy, um, photovoltaics or whatever. Um, and there was quite a bit of discussion. I think we ended up um, one th one thing about it. Even even if it was currently kept, it, the the standard that you're measured against that the, the, the shading is measured on December twenty first, which is the uh, the winter, so it's like the darkest day of the year, right? So you're like, even on a bright, sunny December 21st, there's not a lot of energy to protect. Uh, the standard ought to be sometimes between April 21st and September 21st, and and uh, we think we can probably um, re rewrite it to reflect that. Uh, but the general feeling of the committee was, um, let's see, what did we conclude? Um, we ought to change that test condition, but uh, at the very least, we ought to protect existing solar installations and passive houses, which depend on solar radiation uh, for their heating almost exclusively, and um, and the possibility of protecting potential roof, rooftop solar installations so that it's not an arcade game between neighbors, like who gets their solar up first, um, that if there's potential for solar, there at least has to be a discussion around it. Um, and Mike thought that he could probably draft, um, draft something that would change it. It seems to me worthwhile that particularly at Country Club Road, which is almost ideally positioned for to gain solar on everything that's built there. Um, so it would, well, and then thinking about the change from fourplex to six, if somebody decides to do that by building up a story, that could affect neighboring properties. So it kind of throws a little wrench into the discussion, but it's another consideration. If we make, if we make the change from four to six, it might, the solar shading uh, might um, count, counteract that somewhat. Um, so if, uh, you know, to me, it, it seems like we, we still want to encourage uh, energy efficiency and the move away from fossil fuels. And the easiest way to do that is to promote solar energy. And at the very least, we should be protecting existing installations. Um, passive houses, you know, we may, we may get some passive houses up there. I don't know, but... Um, Potential potential rooftop solar, I think, is worth protecting as well. There are a lot of people who want it and, and just can't do it quite yet. 
we ought to preserve the ability. I think we ought to preserve the ability for them to do that. So, so your general proposal is to keep some solar protection measures in the ordinance, but tweaked a bit. Yeah, right. Right now, it's pretty pretty severe. Not only is the test date severe, but the the amount of shading that's allowed is ridiculously small. <laughs> uh, I mean, you you want to uh, you want to prevent uh, shading when it matters most. But there, you know, some shading is going to be inevitable. So the question is, where do you draw that line? It's it's a very strict um, measure right now. But Mike, you thought you could probably come up with language that would accomplish those things. Yes. <laughs> no, I mean you actually made a made a run at it. I think the only thing. Yeah, I mean I gave you what was basically the 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 twenty twenty one proposal that that got voted down, but we would have to amend the the formula that's used so for the test for the test. Yeah. So pretty much right now the requirement, the rule is that you can't shade roofs, walls, or yards. Um, so you can't park your car and <laughs> just just count towards buildings. <laughs> How far you want to take? Uh, pretty strict. Pretty strict. It's true. So do trees. So those those were the the three requirements. So uh, I mean, if we the twenty twenty one proposal eliminated those three requirements, and it, that proposal said protecting existing and permitted. Um, solar devices and solar devices could be PV or it could be hot water, but if it's a solar device that if it's either already permitted or already existing, then we would protect it. Um, and that kept in, I believe that kept in the, the December 21st number because it wasn't looking at much, but if we were to go through and say, have some other requirement, you know, if it were existing solar and using the, Equinox March to September date instead. Yeah, because December the twenty first, the little that's the lowest angle. So it's yeah. the yeah, and even if it only clips it for for two hours on that one day, it would not be allowed. And it's mm -hmm. kind of like, well, geez, that's kind of yeah. so uh, adjusting it so that way it's really affecting the amount of sunlight in those. Um, we still haven't really talked about how much interference at this point is kind of any interference. So if, if for one hour on March 21st, it hits it technically, that would be the violation. So we don't have any ability to kind of go through and have a determination of waiver of whether or not that's of something, but we can incrementally work towards what council is comfortable with trying to approve. Once, once we have a framework of where you want to go, we can go through and start to answer the rest of those questions. But I think even if we just went to the March dates, that's going to make a big difference. Even if it's just looking at, I guess you were commenting maybe just roofs, but um, well, or is it just existing in? If you wanted to protect as a house, you might have to go to walls too, I guess, which could be very tricky to do. Um, yeah, that's and that's the policy question you guys have to answer. We, I, I can write the rules if you tell me what the policy is. Yeah, it's harder in infill than it is in, you know, development that's being planned from scratch. Uh, yeah, and that's what they, that's, um, John Adams did a good review of the properties and found uh, in, within the downtown and the surrounding neighborhoods that most properties violated the shading rule already. So yeah. it's kind of like most of our, if, if you want that rule that's like, here's a rule you can't rebuild Montpelier because of the zoning that exists. Well, most of it can't be built because of the shading rule. Um, because if you're going to live close together, you're going to shade your neighbor. And that's just, that's going to happen. And you're going to have some, sometimes the sun goes through the window and sometimes it doesn't because it moves and you get a little bit of shade, but that's urban, urban residential living. Lauren. Yeah. Thanks. How how much do you think rooftops are being shaded? How big a problem is that if we were trying to think of something that preserved existing solar, which I do think if people have made, I mean, it's a big investment. So to say that you can build something that all of a sudden makes that investment kind of moot for someone that 
does seem like at least should be considered. Um, and then, you know, but how often are like roofs being, if we're just talking about like potentially thinking about a consideration of rooftop solar and does this like, is there a way to have kind of considerations or if somebody wanted to raise this issue, they could, um, but it doesn't necessarily always mean like you couldn't develop it. Like if nobody raises the objection or something, um, I, I, think don't, I don't know exactly how it works. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think it's the, the tough part about answering that question is that we've got so much topography. Um, so it's not always how close you are to your property line and how close, um, you know, you might be far away geographically, you might be up on, uh, East state street, and somebody might be down on Marvin Street. You got a whole bunch of trees in between us, but according to the model, on this date, it's going to cut across here, and because your house is downhill, might be 300 feet away. <laughs> but it matches the, you know, you, you. So sometimes there's just because of the topography, it it can. So how much, I I really can't say. It's it's going to be tough on a flat. The amount of time we're going to be shading somebody is going to be when somebody's got a two-story house, two and a half-story house next to a single-story ranch. Then you're going to have, if they're close together, you're going to probably have that shading of the roof for a period of that time. Seems like the standard ought to be closer to noon, either side of noon, than dawn or dusk, right? Because you yeah. want, I mean, that's where the that's where the peak solar gain is. And if that's blocked, then there's almost no point in. in and how much at that house. point, if you're talking about at noon, I mean, really at that point, how much shading is there? I mean, it's not well. I'm saying either March, side of noon. If you went two hours either side of noon, let's say, instead of six hours either side of noon, or, or whatever the current rule is, four hours either side of noon, you might you might you might have a more reasonable rule for rooftop, I think, because you would still get the benefit of the. Um, the best part of the day in the best part of the season. We're not talking about just, you know, January and February. We're talking about July. Um, Don I mean, it, something to think about. Don and then Tim. Well, I have a question. Maybe the Energy Committee or Mike or anyone. Uh, is there not some best practices put out there about solar shading uh, that other communities have? That we can look at no this is what i had mentioned last time that there's a legal theory about we are the one of the only ones there's a theory of um legal thing of called ancient lights the theory of ancient lights and basically what it says is you of all the things you have the rights of you have rights going up and you have rights going down into the ground but you don't have the rights to the light that that's why new york city that it's, it was a big thing for new york city as it was building up was but what about my light? I always had my light. You're building this big skyscraper. It's going to take away my light. And they said, you don't have a right to the lights. And so it's actually in a you know, legal theory that people debate that, you know, that's not a, it's not a thing. You don't have a right to the sunlight that hits your house. Um, and so with all the solar development all over the United States, there's no community <laughs> that's taking this on. I can't. I, I don't know if they are. Um, I, I do know when we first proposed this back in 2018, it came, you know, uh, Jerry Tarrant was in and gave a long thing, but he also had lots and lots of complaints of things. And in, in, in totality, we kind of just rolled off with like, I don't know anything about this ancient light until after it got adopted. Then we realized that this is really a thing. And, and that's why most solar projects will try to go through and try to locate in areas where they're in a place where that's not going to be an issue. We're going to be high enough on the hill where development isn't going to interfere or trees growing. They're very, they look at where the topography is because, Hey, there are no trees over there, but there could be, and somebody could plant them and we Tim, either have to control it or stop it. Tim, then Lauren. Yeah. A couple of thoughts. Um, and you mentioned Jerry Church. So I was thinking it sounds like a full employment act for attorneys. <laughs> Well, that's that's good. I mean, I mean just potentially. And, and is there anyone? I mean, how would you empirically determine this? Like, if if for, there's stormwater potential issues, you require the developer to hire an engineering firm to estimate what the stormwater runoffs will be. Or when are we going to also now be in a situation where we have to hire some 
certified light specialist to come in and um, tell us what we're doing for shade. I, yeah. How do we, how's this going to be determined? There are models for it. Um, so going into 2018, we picked our battles and I didn't particularly like this rule. And so I intentionally steered it into a part of it only applies to major site plans, which don't come up very often. So most projects won't trip into this in the first place. Mm -hmm. And if you trip into it, then there's some exceptions in there that go through and say, well, if the building is less than 20 feet tall. It doesn't have to meet the requirement or, or if it's a certain distance based on the setback from an imaginary 20 foot wall. There's a theory in there. Then there's a certain exception. So most properties, most projects that had happened tried to stay within that exemption because they didn't want to spend the money to hire somebody to do the study. But now there are a lot of anyone who installs solar have people who know how to do the studies because to put in a solar project, okay. that's what they do. So you'd just hire a solar guy. So just one more cost to develop, but it would be one more cost to develop to, okay. to prove it. Thank you. Lauren. Well, just on that point, I mean, there's very simple tools solar developers do free assessments of every house. Like it's like literally you go around, you can do it from Google earth now, apparently like it's, this would not be a big expensive new thing. It would be another hoop to jump through. Like, yeah. Um, but like, just, just to be clear, there's really good cheap to free technology right now that does this. So I don't think it's, that's a big barrier. Even just doing a quick Google search, like, there's a DC zoning regulation on solar shading. Like, so I do think this is happening all over, probably since 2018, it's popped up a lot more with the massive explosion. So I do think if we wanted to think about like theirs is you can't, if you are, this is just for existing solar. And it's like, if you're going to obstruct more than 5% of the system. So it's like a impact on the system's productivity. I don't know if that's a good standard or not, but anyway, other communities have, thought about this. We do have a little more time now. We could throw it out to the energy committee to do some research and come up with some ideas if there's a simple way. I mean, it, and I do just want to be clear, like the energy committee did also very much recognize, or, or I heard this anyway, like we want dense housing and that is a huge priority. And that is a climate strategy, like having people in walkable compact community centers. So there was, people were not trying to be like, let's throw out barriers because solar is more important than housing. It was, how do we have a minimally, you know, how do we like protect solar, um, but not, but be as little intrusive as possible. So I just want to like share that context because that was the tenor of the conversation as I was hearing it. Um, so I think it was like, if there's just a way, especially in my mind to protect existing or like projects that are in the works, it does seem like you're impacting somebody else's property value and something they've invested in. So that seems just worth considering to me. And then if there's some simple way of looking at other, but I, I would happily throw to the energy committee to do some, some research and see if any communities have figured out a good, simple way to look at this. Well, you know, that's the thought that was going through my mind as I was listening to this conversation. Is it just seems like we don't really know enough yet. You know, there's, we could, but we don't yet. <laughs> but, you know, because we want to, want, we've already encouraged people to put solar collectors on their houses and stuff. And, you know, we've put uh, subsidies into it and that's a good thing. And we, now we don't want to screw them by letting someone shade their there are solar panels. Just one more question, but Mike, Mike, you said that you in 2018 you steered it toward new or toward major projects or new new development. Mm -hmm. Is that yeah. is that how it currently applies? That's how it currently applies. So so that can be done because I think it's especially important for new development in a place like Country Club where you you know you can plan this um, in advance and not have to uh, retrofit stuff but it also applies to infill projects at this time as well so oh, mm -hmm. um you know the infill building on ewing street was one of them that had to do the analysis to make sure it wouldn't impact mm -hmm. fortunately in that case it sits on the south side of the road so it had an entire road between it and its neighbor across the street so it had extra space um, so it, it, okay. that in that case, it got approved because this, there's enough space difference between it and the neighbors. But if you were thinking about, um, say, something on, on 
in in the meadow on Vine Street or something, mm-hmm. it's going to have a different orientation depending on which side of the road you might very easily end up I'm trying to think of the the other ones. What Winter Street that runs kind of north south, mm-hmm. you're going to very easily block your neighbor who's to the north of you, to the north of you, to the north of you because you're close. So where do we come down on this? Leave it the way it's it has come to us at this point, figuring that we will be reviewing it again at our next public hearing? Or is there another proposal? Uh, or Lauren, sorry. Just, just process-wise for things that the planning commission would consider is it does it have to be specific language or if there was a kind of general motion that we're looking at language to try to protect existing solar or consider existing solar in um in new developments, would that be enough? Or would, if we then changed it, if we don't change it now and we change it next time, does that then trigger another trip to the planning commission? It probably could. Um, but if we went, if we got the general policy, I can write the general policy and they can approve it. So if you said what we want are the rules to say, protect existing PV, we want the analysis to be between March 21st, September 21st, and we want the analysis to look at 10 o'clock to 2 o'clock. I can write something up that then says we're still going to have the protection of existing PV, and the analysis would come in in these these time frames. And PV and hot water. What's that? PV and water. PV and hot water, yeah. yeah. So uh, existing solar devices, I think. Yeah, all... okay. Does that work for everybody? And also, to take any reference out to the passive? That seems really hard to. That was the house. Yeah. But, but well, passive any passive structure. I mean, if you think about even if you, yeah, because everybody gets some passive. It seems kind of nebulous. Yeah. Difficult. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I mean, the this is pretty straightforward. It would be easy to study and analyze and put together a set of rules that says that's that's what we're doing. And now, with any of these changes, we'll go through. We'll make you know, a draft number two or draft number three or whatever we're on, you'll still be able to make adjustments. If if we get everything back and you come back next time, you're like, oh, we should make this little tweak or that little tweak. They're probably not substantial changes at that point. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's still possible. You could come up and say, whoa, we missed something. We'll make a substantial change. We get kicked one more meeting. Mm-hmm. It is what it is. We had 21 meetings in 2017. Those were the days. Uh, uh, you all remember those. Like, could we see what it would what it would take to protect passive i mean i think i think if we could see what it would how it would be different from in other words if the basics was the three things we mentioned and then passive was the potential fourth and we could see how how much difference it would make in the ruling it might be it might be easier to evaluate it would it be that much more work to try and work that out i think one of the differences i'm just trying to think off the top of my head we're we're we've Discounted winter, we've taken it out of December and moved it to March to September. So you're automatically going to be moving more into where shading is going to be helping to cool rather than you're doing analysis to cool, not analysis to heat. So I think we'd have to have a different analysis. Um, And I, I think that's a trickier trickier one i think we because how much how much shading would affect because you certainly probably wouldn't have a rule that says you can't shade any part of any passive solar house i mean then then we're like or what percentage of what wall or what yeah, percentage that's the energy we need to tackle that one and see <laughs> yeah see what they come up with uh, carrie you haven't been heard from um, yeah, so I am completely unqualified to make decisions like this, and I think that most of us are. And and um, I, I, sitting around having a discussion like this, or what, what if we try this? What if we try that? Does not feel like a great way to 
create that. public policy. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I think we're, we're giving some guidance to the kinds of things we would like to know more about and hear more about, but I would much rather hear from the energy committee or back from the planning commission with more specific recommendations. Like, I don't know if 10 to two during on March, whatever is the time I, I can't make that decision right now. Donna. I just have the concern that you're doing it once a year, the test, because the sun is different in the summer and the winter and your solar operates differently. So it would seem to me you would want a test at both ends. That's just a practicality, but I mean, Carrie's right. And just. And Tom Weiss. I step up. Request. Okay. Well, I would draw my request to comment. Thank you. All right. Are we good to go ahead without, uh, Without that, we've got some other things that we still need to figure out what we're going to do. I assume that all the things that are in your checklist where you said so-and-so had an, 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 a, a suggestion and you said, fine, we'll, we'll do that. Those are all good. I haven't heard anyone say, yeah, we don't like those. Um, we do have still the sign question. And what we want to do about that. And re remember, reminder to the council, we have three options. Keep it as is, 12 feet, increase it to 15 feet, or 12 feet with, uh, with a waiver rule or a waiver option. And Donna. I like the waiver rule that goes to the D DRB. That would be my preference. Okay. Seeing everybody nodding. Um, okay. Um, and the stormwater rules. That's the other big thing I think that we don't, uh, that we haven't made a decision on yet. Do we incorporate, uh, the question just is, do we incorporate this proposal into into the ordinance? Well, it, made, it seems to make sense. It, it yeah. came from public works. They ought to know. Yeah. There are experts in this. Yep. Everybody else is okay with that? Okay. So are we, are we ready for a motion that says we move to adopt this with the following amendments? And does someone have a list in their mind of what all the amendments are? <laughs> we think we there's so much here, and it's been kind of cobbed together and, and put out in a couple of different formats. I I really want to know what I'm voting on, and I don't feel like that's what we're going to get tonight. <laughs> It'd be nice to have it written out for the next one, so we could say these are the amendments, and we can do that. I mean, this has Mr. Weiss's comments infused in it and all kinds of other stuff. I, I just don't feel like it's something I can work with. Mm -hmm. it's, it was a good tool to get us here. But... That's, that's fair. Carrie. Yeah, I think I think that the information is all here somewhere, but, um, but the public isn't going to be able to understand what it is we're doing right now if we make this decision right now. So I'd rather wait and have a, a clean version of everything prepared and give people a chance to see it before we vote on it. We're, so probably... we're going to have to have another hearing anyways, because there's going to okay. be a substantial change, but we need to, to, to kick into the substantial improvement. You need to make an amendment to make the changes that you discussed tonight. So what we need, we're probably looking at two more hearings, right? Just, just one. Well, what I'm hearing a couple of people say is that they're not ready to vote on anything at this point. Um, Donna. Well, I, I feel like voting on a draft because it's another draft that he's taking back to the planning commission. They're going to make their comments and come back. It's just one of those another rough drafts. So I, I'd like us to be willing to go with the roughness of this just to create a draft that is more clear, more readable, understandable, and that we'll have probably two more hearings on it. And well, Mike says one, but we could have two. 
Um, but to, just to kick it further down the road so the commission then can work on it before the next council meeting would be my druthers. Lauren. So essentially, can our motion be to, it's to amend, but it will be for, like for future consideration. Like we're not yes. actually adopting it tonight. We're just, oh, we're, no, we're, 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 saying... we're amending a, a, a version that we can then consider and discuss further and have a clean and have another full robust conversation. And yes. it could be multiple conversations if we want. So that's just what we're voting on to be clear. We used the word adopt came up, but we're not actually adopting yeah, anything. No, tonight. we're not adopting tonight. Be a further draft. <laughs> <laughs> so somebody Lauren you look like you're getting well, well, I'm willing to make that motion but I did not take all the notes on what we need to do so I don't know if Mike has a list handy or I can run through the list really quickly on what I had I'll be looking at the tape on okay yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right so the it's a motion with the following amendments to accept the, the following amendments. They would be to amend the use table regarding water supply and sewer related facilities and greenhouses. and to remove the non-conforming requirements from 3002 and to expand the density exemption from four to six and to draft new solar protection requirements with a policy of protecting existing piece PV or existing solar, solar devices mm -hmm. okay. and to adjust the analysis March to September and 10 to two. We can always adjust those depending on what MIAC comes back with and to amend, amend the sign rule I got the number there. Uh, 12 feet with a waiver provision. Yep. To add a waiver provision to the sign, the freestanding sign height. Mm -hmm. And yeah. to add stormwater. And to add the stormwater, yes. So is that your motion? Oh, said it so well, Mike. We have to list the urban. Addition, urban district? No, that was put into this this draft. What okay. you have in okay. front of you okay. is the revised draft. Yeah. Great. These are the I changes just, based on that. Just oh. So that's a motion. Is there is there a second? Okay. Is there any discussion? Tim. It's still not comfortable having the amend zoning for the country club road property and yet till we work it through more. It just that's a really big change. Uh, okay. It's so uncomfortable that we're doing it for this one property because we own it. It feels like animal farm to me. You know, it's it's, it's uh, it, if it's a fair policy, it should be enforced fairly to all the properties that it should apply to, and not just ours because we own it. I'm, I know I've said it before, but I'm really struggling with it. It feels like bad government. Any other discussion? Are we ready to vote? Him or Sam, Sam. Is there an alternative? For, uh, what are you proposing? You can take the Country Club Road piece out for now and we can keep discussing it. But I don't want to approve it as. Well, we're not voting to approve it, are we? I mean, we're voting to draft another draft. If, if, if there are changes that you'd like to see in another draft, we ought to include those. And if they include additional rezoning, it does. We can add that to the motion. Okay. If you could add that, I'd appreciate it. I mean, I don't know what people think so, about so that. So it'd be an but... amendment to... 
Well, um, we have a motion that's been seconded. Mm -hmm. If if you wanted to move to amend that, you could make that motion. Okay. So I guess I move that we um, include provision to expand the urban residential zone or, or provision to study expanding the urban residential zone to other adjacent properties that may be appropriate in addition to the Country Club Road property. Is there a second for that uh, motion? I'll second. Okay. Is there, uh, uh, Lauren? Are are we asking the Planning Commission to study and come back with a recommendation? Or, I mean, I, if so, question. I think that's fine. I just want to be clear direction to. Is yeah, that what, for, is that what you want? Actually, yeah. Okay, so yeah. it's trying to get a recommendation from the planning commission on. Okay. Donna. And is there a time on that? Is it supposed to come back with the draft of the other changes? I assume that's what you're thinking, right? Yeah, I assume so. Okay. Any more discussion about that? Oh, sorry, Lauren. Just, I, I'm fine with that. I, I like the idea of looking more broadly. I think I would personally caveat that with, I like, I don't want to slow down the process knowing there's a bunch of steps. So if they come back and say there's potential, but we need to spend more time thinking about it and looking, um, you know, but we think this is a district, the form of this would work in other areas and we're just assessing that to me that would give me comfort that it's constructed well it's the kind of district that could fit with some of the surrounding parcels and be woven into the master planning process for example but but i don't want to like my vote is not contingent on all of those questions being answered to, to keep moving that forward so i just don't want the planning commission to think they have to, from my perspective supporting this motion I don't mean that all every answer to the, every question has to be done before we might move forward with pieces of it personally, but I, I don't know what other people think if like, cause I just don't want to give direction that it sounds like we need this entire next phase done before we would move, potentially move forward with other pieces of these zoning changes. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. And, sorry. <laughs> You're the wordy because I thought it was just to, to, to study, do at least a look to see if they thought there were other parcels that it would apply to. But that, that could the, productively apply to or something like yeah, that. Yeah, but it, but that was the real scope, just to say, yes, there is, or no, we don't think so, and yes, there is, there are these. Right. Okay, I can deal with that to find scope. Thank you. Okay. Barry. Um, yeah, I, so I agree with all of this. I, I definitely want to hear more about where else it could apply, and I like the idea of applying it more broadly and not just for one specific property. And, and it, yeah, I just want to be clear that I'll vote for this and... I'm not going to expect to have all the answers before we can move on with the rest of it too. Just so just reiterating what Lauren said, that that's where I'm coming from also. All right. Are you ready to vote on the motion to amend uh, Lauren's motion? Do you have the motion in mind, John? I'm going to have to check on this. One. Okay. Okay. <laughs> with that, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. So Lauren's motion has been amended. And now we're to the uh, original motion with that amendment. Is there any further discussion on that? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. There we are. We've got, uh, we've made progress once again. Um, yeah. Now, now we have uh, the river hazard that we kind of left off. Uh, that we have to, we could um, probably adopt this one if you guys chose to. I said I would look at that design flood elevation. Um, so I have suggested language I would put in there. I don't think it would be a significant, a substantial change, but it just would be a 720 point C. There's an A and a B already. This would just be a new C for the purposes of critical facilities 
the design flood elevation referenced in these regulations shall be equivalent to the point zero point two annual chance flood event plus two feet. So that gets addresses the point that Thomas had made. So at this point, we need to vote on whether to. You could vote to adopt as amended. The design or the, the river hazard river area hazard. regulations as so, amended. Is there a second? Okay. Do we need further discussion or to have a clear? Have you just say once more for everybody's benefit what exactly this vote is? This is a vote to adopt the proposal you received plus that amendment. All right. And this, so we're not coming back for another year. Not coming back. We River had... hazard will be done. I yep. will not be coming back to talk about that one in two weeks. Okay. Ready for a vote? So, so the, the question about the maps and the adjacent areas, that, that would be for future because we don't have the maps. Correct. Okay. And this is just for critical facilities, as you've outlined before, or is it beyond? Crit critical facilities, the sheetrock question, uh, a couple of minor okay. amendments that were in there. It was not not big. Mostly. Yeah, there, were, there wasn't a lot that was really big. It was mostly to address the critical facilities question. And these were proposed before the flood and just got held up. So just hypothetically, if we have to renovate the fire station and it's a critical facility, is there some little place we can get hooked by doing this where all of a sudden, oh no, now we have to raise the whole building? Uh, it's it's the same rules are in effect right now. So you um, existing buildings, they can't be um, substantially damaged. So there's not a requirement to, to tear down the fire station. Uh, if there was a decision that we were going to build a new fire station because this one was just not appropriate in its location, then it would have to be two feet point. above the 500 right. year. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. All right. Ready to vote? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right. Now. Not done with me yet. We are to, do we need to take a break before we talk about the building code amendments? It's uh, It's been about an hour and a half since our break. Are, do you, are people wanting another break? Okay, let's take a break till 10.15. I'm going to get us started again. Um, and I see that Pellin is uh, is still connected. Well, I want to make sure when, when, when her face appears, we'll start. Because we don't want her to have to miss. Here we go. So, Mike, we're on to item nine, second reading or second public hearing of the building code. So I will open the public hearing. All right. So this is the second reading. So this is adopted as an ordinance. This is more typical to your process. Um, because we have all the same faces, I'm not going to bore everybody with the same presentation I made last time. And I'm going to kind of jump to the end. Um, Do you want to share your screen? Maybe you are. Oh, I can do this real quick. Uh, I've, I've just, I had to open up the program first so I can get back into Zoom. So I can share screen. All right, so really quick, I mean, these, I'm not gonna go through all of the pieces, but I'm gonna get to the end. So really the big thing was we got into this for the fees. Um, I will stop at this slide to go through um, some fee examples. So this whole purpose of this was that two things. First, um, we have a 
we did our end of year sur uh, survey of permits and we realized that 25% uh, of, of all the permits that we get for building, we're not collecting any fees on. So the proposal was um, to, and those were all tied to the energy efficiency exemption. So planning department and myself, we proposed that we have council consider removing that fee exemption because it's having uh, an impact on our revenues that we are collecting. So. Just so people know, fees for commercial projects, this is for any commercial project, is $10 for the first thousand plus $850 for each additional thousand. That's what the state charges. I'll have a few examples to show you what that means. And fees for residential are $10 per thousand for the first thousand plus $350 for each additional. So some examples, if you had a commercial project to do an $11,000 efficiency project, there'd be $10 for the first thousand. 850 times 10 for $85, $95 permit for an $11,000 project, plus $30, $30 to go to John for the recording fee. If you had a $50,000 project, that's a $426 fee plus 30, and a quarter million dollar project, if you're doing a big solar project or a big big something, you, you might end up with a $2,126 fee plus $30, except right now you wouldn't pay anything because we exempt fees. Residential, um, these were some projects I did. I did a heat pump at my house. Um, I live in Hardwick, so it doesn't wouldn't have mattered, but that $4,000 heat pump is $10 plus 14 or $24 permit. And for a $30,000 home insulation, that might cost you $121 plus $30 for recording fee if you had to pay fees. So those are the order of magnitude that we're talking about for fees. Um, and so, Obviously, much larger projects could have uh, much different, uh, much larger fees. And we still do all the work for these projects. We're just not collecting any fees on them. And then the second half of this was we had a whole bunch of problems in our actual ordinance that did not address certain important things like we have a, 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 cooperative, a cooperative agreement. That cooperative agreement is not reflected in our ordinance or any of the requirements in that cooperative agreement. Um, we have penalties, but we don't have the proper rules to let us to actually enforce those uh, penalties. So we have to kind of clean and fix those up. And we had outdated codes from 2003 and 2010. So we need to update our codes. So decision points. So I gave you a bunch of revised ordinances uh, that made all those changes. But um, we have a couple of final things to make, final decisions to make, and then you can either vote to approve it or you can vote to have a, a third reading to reflect these changes. Um, first, when I was doing this, uh, I was having a conversation and it turns out there's a third fee. So there are three exemptions. I told you guys about two. Uh, I told you about the energy efficiency and the accessibility, but there's also a sprinkler exemption. So we need to talk about that. We could leave the sprinkler exemption. We haven't had any applications for them, by the way. That's why it really didn't show up. Um, you could leave it. You could remove the exemption at this time, or you could amend it um, to be similar to energy efficiency and the other ones if it remains, and we'll have that conversation in a minute. I also noted related to the sprinkler in section 201-1, the sprinkler, we talked about the fact that sprinklers are not required for one and two family structures, but that really didn't clearly appear in the actual document. So my suggestion is the easiest thing we could do is to add a number seven, one and two family structures. And it would be very clearly in there that those are exempt. So that's a recommendation. Um, we had a recommendation um, from Councillor Heaney, that maybe we should consider extending the building permits as well. So uh, I would suggest section 107, we change one year to two years, that would extend any building permits to be open for two years. And the other three decision points are the energy efficiency fee, which was the point of this. We could keep the exemption. We could amend it to something less, such as only residential is exempt or only residential projects less than $10,000 are exempt. 
um, or we could remove the exemption uh, altogether, which is actually what is proposed in the draft, is to remove the exemption. Uh, we briefly discussed the fee refunds for projects that have not been completed. That's not a big deal. Um, we can certainly not need to deal with that. Um, and then there's the accessibility exemption, which is similar to these, uh, energy efficiency and sprinklers. Commercial projects are required to do them. We do all the inspections, but they don't have to pay fees. So we also could go through and say, all three of our exemptions, maybe they should only apply to residential, considering if this building were in Berlin or Barrie or in any other city, they would be required to pay fees. Uh, it's only in Montpelier, you don't have to pay the fees. Residential, um, we could have a system. So that would be a thought to consider is to have all the fee exemptions kind of be similar. Um, maybe commercial pays for all of them. Maybe only accessibility, sprinkler, and energy efficiencies that are $10,000 or less are exempt or something to that effect. Those are just some ideas, but that's it. Those are the, the decision points that we have left on the building regulations. All right. I'll first see if there's any member of the public who wishes to be recognized on on this item. And there aren't that many members of the public left out there. See, seeing no requests for uh participation from members of the public, I will close the public hearing and we can move to council discussion. Should we just go down the list of questions and see what people think? Yeah, I'll go, let me go back to the previous page here. So yeah. Here we go. Um, so is sprinkler fee exemption the first one? Sprinkler fee exemption was the first one, or we could talk about all the exemptions at the same time and just skip that one for now. Okay. What do people want to do about exemptions? Tim. It's tough because they're all things we want to encourage people to do. <laughs> and they're all, I mean, the sprinkler piece, having put a few of those systems in, and it's it's not in homes. It's where we're going to have the most impact and safety. It's, it's old buildings and, um, it's just crazy costly, but I think we, you know, we still need to help people do it and make it happen. I'm not sure this exemption is the best incentive, so maybe that's the conversation. I mean, maybe if they're going to put in a sprinkler system, we find a way to waive the hookup fee because usually there's a separate hookup fee to the water system for that that's separate. Um, just something that would encourage it because it really it is a good direction to go in. And the hookup fee is probably more than the uh, application fee. That would be more than that because it's what around a thousand or twelve hundred dollars for the water hookup. I don't know off the top of my head what Since the hookup is. Yes, for those, works, right? But yeah, um, I, I don't know. That's one to think of. And then the energy piece. I mean, how can you <laughs> discourage that? I don't know. Lauren, yeah, I, you look like you're about to. So, I mean, more on. I can just share briefly the conversation that Miak had, although Sal. Um, maybe took better notes, but I mean, my, my impression of the conversation was basically people were really trying to like directionally, they were like, you know, we still want to be encouraging energy efficiency. So we don't want to be doing things that go in a different direction, but in the spirit of trying to be responsive of this um, city staff uh, recommendation, they had talked about some of the ideas that Mike had um, put here, like, um, exempting commercial from it and maybe putting some kind of cap on residential, like was, was one idea that was discussed. I mean, people were also like, these are kind of nominal fees. I, there were different opinions, I would say, like among the committee, um, of like how big a deal this really is. Um, but yeah, so I guess, you know, so my impression, and I think Sal and I might have slightly different feelings on this is like, I, I just feel like there's federal incentives right now for energy efficiency, their state incentives, like where people are like wanting to do everything possible to like encourage and like, so to me, 
I don't like any fee. It's bringing in $10,000 total. It's not even that much money. Like, it just seems like, why are we picking this fight to like go after? It just seems like the wrong thing to be focused on. If we want to raise $10,000, let's look at other places to do it than from energy efficiency. And like, you know, but if we were go, if we want to go in the direction, then I, I think like the commercial with some kind of like, I might put it more at like 20,000 or up for projects. I there's, like the place to me where there's like decision points are more like if you're doing 20,000 and up, that's like, that's a big project. That's presumably probably more work for the city looking at bigger scale projects. Um, but like a heating system decision, you might have to do like two heat pumps. You might be getting over that $10,000 mark. And then you're like, well, do I do this? Do I put a fossil fuel boiler in? And like, those are real decisions people are making. And so I want to be doing everything we are to encourage and to, just demonstrate that the city is encouraging that through its actions. So to me, I just feel like at a, at a minimum, like maybe commercial and some kind of like cost parameter, but I'd be happy just not doing this at all. <laughs> so I think I was the lone member of the energy committee <laughs> who just said, let's get rid of the exemptions. Um, and part of my thinking was that, as with sprinklers, I mean, you save on insurance over time, right? Um, with energy improvements, the you know the fee, the permit fee, is part of the payback calculation, and and the payback is never you know next week. It's always a couple of years down the road, and people are making that calculation. And so, to me, it's really sort of insignificant. And we're doing the we're doing the work. Um, we might as well include the fee. Most of those projects are amortized with a loan of some kind. I mean, it's, it's just, uh, it's, it's not an overwhelming amount. It's not the a large enough amount that someone's gonna, e even a residential project of $10,000, it's, it's just not that big a hump to get to get over. And, um, and we were, we just spent a couple of weeks fighting over $10,000. So that's my <laughs> two cents. Uh, I'm with you. I feel like we do all these little exemptions that are just a blink in the eye. And I feel like the planning does the work. And sometimes one is as many as a large project. So I would tend to just get rid of all the exemptions. Including the handicap accessibility. Maybe not that one. <laughs> Accessibility can also include some large projects. I mean, elevators and those types yeah. of things. And so they're projects that take a number of inspections and a number of work. So that's why some of the, if it were to apply to commercial and residential as a term is also big. So it also could be a five-story residential building. But you've got more exemptions than we're seeing here. I was thinking of no, the ones we, we were talking it's about. It's just the three. There are the three. There's the accessibility, but because accessibility applies. I, didn't access I had the sprinkler, the energy efficient. See, it's three. It's and three access yeah. Accessibility is the so, third. Yeah, but still, you're you're you want to make a motion to keep them all there to eliminate the the exemptions. Uh, I would for the energy efficiency and the sprinklers. Uh, so I have a question about the sprinklers. Um, are there some properties that are required to have sprinklers and some that are not? So it it looks to me like we have some cases where people have to do these things. They have to put sprinklers in, they have to make things accessible. And so if we can kind of ease that burden a little bit by whatever way we can. And I don't know if the, if the fee exemption is the way to do it. Like Tim pointed out, that might not make that much of a difference. Then I'm okay with that. I think the energy efficiency, I I'm compelled by the idea that we want to show that we're supporting this and do whatever we can to encourage people and that especially if it's a small amount of money um relatively speaking but i also i'm dubious that anyone's going to decide not to do the energy efficiency work because they had to pay the permit fee so i'm not sure it's making that much difference and that's an interesting point. The way you phrased it is it would it sounds as though you would think that uh, you would exempt 
projects where some measure is required from a fee, but you would continue the uh, fee for someone who's choosing to do it even if they're not required to, which seems like kind of backwards because if we're looking to if we're looking to the fee waiver as an or a fee exemption as a incentive, then that it, it seems like it's counter to what you what I expected to hear you say. Yeah, I think that's very clarifying. You're right. It doesn't work as an incentive that way. So I'm definitely looking at it from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Lauren. Based, based on, um, on camera, um, I've just had a number of conversations with people who are in the field trying to encourage energy efficiency and like, like our utilities, for example, who have really wrestled with what is the right amount of incentive that actually motivates people. And I do think people get, you know, when we, got quotes on heat pumps, for example, like you get the whole breakdown of the cost that would include permit fees and everything. So I think that is part of the line item that goes into your bottom line and you're weighing, do I do this? And like, we decided not to, and we went with a pellet boiler, which I still don't think was a good idea, but like the cost breakdown and all of that. So like my understanding from a lot of that is that people are really looking at, it's like a hundred a hundred dollar incentive is a meaningful difference when when GMP went from 200 to 300 for heat pumps they saw a massive uptake and some of it I think is just psychological really and so like yeah I, I I don't know for sure but it just feels directionally wrong to be just adding expense making it like that many more people like a little bit less likely when we have this urgent crisis we just had a climate catastrophe in our town to be like well now's the time to like make it slightly more expensive to do energy efficiency and to switch to those heat pumps that get your stuff out of the basement and like i don't know it just feels like like i'll go look for ten thousand other dollars i don't know like this stuff. <laughs> unlike the heat pump that has a wonderful recognition of their going from one price to another i don't think we get credit for our exemptions. I don't think it the, the residents really appreciated that it feeds back into their feeling about the city or their, or, you know. Maybe I agree with that. Enough. I think it's more a like behavior thing when we're looking to try to get as many people to do something. I mean, I think we could ask MIAC to do a public campaign, like go, you know, do energy efficiency. The city's encouraging it in these ways. We've got this program. We've got a fee exemption. Like I, I agree. Like if we're, if we're going to keep any exemption, we should probably promote it as part of like the package of why it's affordable. I, I think that's a great thing we could and should do if we decide to keep it. Even if we keep like a small, like if you're doing a residential project under ten thousand or whatever. Like I'm maybe. feeling cheap. It's like I feel like they should not refund things that aren't complete at least keep half of it you know it's like a deposit <laughs> well I'm, I'm with you on that but 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 let's focus on the, let's focus on the <laughs> okay so where are we let's have a motion one way or the other so i don't think you actually made a motion you just but I move that we um, we remove all exemptions Is there from, a from energy projects, uh, yep. ADA, and sprinklers. Is there a second? I'll second it. All right. Do we have any further discussion? I think I mostly have a sense of where people are, but uh, I don't want to prematurely cut off discussion. All right, let's have a vote, and I'm going to uh, call the roll. Uh, uh, Donna? Aye. Carrie? No. Sal? Aye. Tim? No. Helen? I think that's a yes. Okay. And uh, Lauren? No. So what are, where are we with that? Three, three. three. <laughs> Well, we always do. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Chair votes yes.
All right, next. So that was all three exemptions are out then? Yep. Okay, just making sure I'm keeping it on mm -hmm. straight in my head. Uh, so the next one would be, um, and this is really just a clarification, to add number seven, one and two family structures to section 201, that would just clarify that the sprinkler exemption is for one and two families, which it is, but for some reason it's not really clearly written in the ordinance. So do you want a motion for that? Uh, we can do that one separately, or we can add it to the next one, which was your Section 107 request to add one year to two year. Okay. And are there anything else? Just those two. Before you get too far ahead of yourself, yep. let's uh, move on that. Those two. Let's make a motion that we um, extend the permit periods from one year to two years, and that we clarify the language uh, to be clear that sprinkler systems wouldn't be required for one and two unit presidential properties. So, yep. Mm -hmm. so, okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay. And I think the last one was just the, if we want to do anything about the refunding of fees for projects that are not completed. And currently we refund 100%. So sometimes people come in, they do projects. And because we were talking about fees, I wanted to come in and just go through and put that on the table. That is one of our things. We do give 100% fees. So uh, in a lot of cases, we put a lot of work in at the start to approve projects, to plan reviews and, and the like. And then the project doesn't go, so we return all the fees. Now, what about and we're this? fine with that, but mm -hmm. it's just to make sure everyone knows that's a policy that you have the right to make. What, what if we went to a system where we uh, did not refund the fee, but if they came back in with the, the same or a similar project within a couple of years that they wouldn't have to pay a new fee? I think keeping track of that might be tricky over the long term. There'd have to be a time period on that. <laughs> yeah. Build inspectors come and go, and how many times has this come up? Uh, we get a, a number of them, especially for projects that either got cut short, so somebody got approved for a large project, came in smaller, and we'll have to give a, a refund of a certain amount. Um, like I said, it's it's not a, a big item. Like I said, our our big thing is the building for years and years and years for the first six years that I was working, the building department and the building inspector raised enough fees to cover his his salary as Chris Lumbra. And over the past three or four years, we have been having to get basically subsidized by the general fund. And so we're we were just trying to identify different ways that we could, you know, we're that's not the intention. Our intention is that we pay for ourselves. Building permits pay for themselves. And right now we're not. And part of this is fee exemptions, big chunk of fee exemptions, and some of them are these little things, but um, I don't think this will make a significant difference. I don't think we need to address it if you don't want to, but I, I wanted, after going to all the budget meetings and the questions were like, hey, uh, can staff kick over some rocks and see where there are opportunities? This is where we thought, if we're already talking about fees, let's at least mention the fact that we refund projects. Maybe there's a portion of those that don't get refunded. Um, get Donna. refunded except for X amount. Donna. Uh, would it be too much administrative work to say refund 50% or I don't know at what point you, you the staff has done 50% of the work, 75% of the work, if if the de deposit could be refunded as to in proportion to the level of work? I mean, what would you suggest would be administratively possible or easiest? I would probably say, because usually... Because people can come in, we ask people to estimate their costs, and we expect it might go up a little bit more, and they owe us a little bit, they might come down a little bit more, we give them a refund. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about for the projects that have been big projects that don't get developed, they pay the fee and then don't come in. I think if there was a, uh, you can get a refund except for, even if it was except for $50, we've gotten some part of our time you know, that wouldn't even cover a portion of the amount of time, you know, at, at $50 an hour, there probably is more than an hour's work that went into processing the application. Audra's work on her end, 
um, Michelle's work on her end to go through and do the review of the application to make sure it determines, make sure it meets the rules. So, I mean, if there was an easy thing, it would probably be you can get a refund except for $50. Um, then at least we're keeping a point. Higher or lower than 50%? A 50% would be, I mean, in some projects, if a big project got canceled for some reason, that, I mean, that could be, we have fees that could be twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000. So if somebody were planning a big project that for some reason financing fell through on and they decided to cancel it. Yeah, you know, I would say a lot of times you do a 50% deposit that's not refundable on things. So that's why I was thinking 50%. Flat number. Yeah, I, I would be. I would not I'd be. I'd be more inclined to go with a flat amount than I am a percentage because, and on a big project, let's say, uh, the on on Main Street, the the new facility there for um, Alzheimer's. They, so that mm -hmm. when that project was built, that was twenty eight thousand dollar permit, um, something in that area. So. You know, obviously, if that fell through, most of our work in that project is going through and doing the inspections, the weekly inspections, and going in and seeing these guys every Friday. So there's a chunk of that that's just going to pay our time for all those inspections that don't happen if a project gets canceled. So it wouldn't seem right to be charging the 50% because we're not really doing 50% of the work up front. Well, $50 doesn't seem worth the paperwork. It wasn't, I would say at least 100 <laughs> Or, yeah, I mean, like I said, 50 100 if there's if there's a fixed dollar amount, that would that would work. If you have a problem, if you're, if you're a non-residential applicant and you're doing a big project like that, it seems like the reason it doesn't happen is because the financing falls through or usually that's the last permit you get so it's not usually because there's a permit or there's an appeal usually your building permit is your last permit that's when you are ready to build you're going to come in and drop your check on for the for the building permit. and they've invested whatever money they were going to invest on doing the planning and the design and everything else yep and for a big project that could require plan review and you know there's a lot so usually those Projects don't fall through, but we we have had some where it's just been like, uh. <laughs> so everyone's like, we shouldn't refund these. I'm like, I'll mention it, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Any motions? So we move that we don't refund once you pay the fee, right? Right. Would be my take. It sounds like that's well, that we don't refund at all. Yeah, that my 50% was being large. <laughs> Yay, yeah, I don't know. I've done enough permits. I don't, yeah, I can't, I just can't think of a time I would have gone back in. So, things and things don't always go the way you plan, but yeah, it's up to you. Yeah, by the time you're into that, you're at that point, you probably don't have a surprise that's so big that you decide you can't go forward. <laughs> well, you right. might, but... Because that's the other way that you would you would cancel a project. Lauren, like I said, I move that once fees are paid, we don't refund on building permits. Okay, Lauren, you had your hand up. Yeah, I was just curious. Do you know how other communities with similar permit programs deal with this? I don't actually have that. I don't actually know that one. I mean, there are only a handful of communities that do it. Barry, Burlington. So, so I, I think permit fees are adjusted upward if the project costs more than was estimated when the fee was applied for. Are they adjusted downward as well? They're adjusted downward. So yeah. if, if a project comes in less, but that's usually, those are usually smaller amounts. So yeah. somebody will estimate, you know, this whole building, this new addition is going to cost, uh, you know, $110,000. We pay the fee and it comes in at, you know, 102. So they get a refund for the $8,000 and, and that's fine um, because we're getting a chunk of fee 
along with that. Usually those are pretty close to the estimates. Hmm. Gary. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking about the very small projects, someone who's uh, like renovating a bathroom, would that fall under this? Or, you know, not building a whole new building, but just something small in their house or they're doing something to the garage and then it doesn't work out. They decide not to do it. And in that case, the permit fee could actually make a, a difference to that, you know, that one person who's trying to do something to fix up their house. I, did, I, I like the fact that we haven't been, that we've been refunding them. That just feels nice to me. It feels like if you didn't do it, you don't need the permit. So why are you paying for a permit if you didn't do the work? And I'm also very sympathetic to the idea that you're, you are you are doing a lot of work. The city's doing a lot of work for this. So, so I think, um, you know, a, a flat fee of that's basically like the processing fee or sort of the administrative fee that you don't get back makes more sense to me than no refund or a percentage. So that's what I'd be more inclined to go with. So do you want to move to amend the motion? I think we'd have to you vote, vote for down on these one. Amend the motion. Or I can amend it right because I made the motion. You, you can move to amend, to amend your motion too. So make the motion um, if a project isn't done, um, retain a $500 processing fee and return the unused portion of the permit fee. Is there a second to that? Sorry, what's the permit fee? It, it, first five hundred dollars for a processing fee, and then after that, it goes refund. back. Mm -hmm. But on those big projects, they've done all that work already, so it's better than nothing. But I still think we're letting the the staff have all this time put in and it doesn't happen. They're not being paid. We've established those fees for a reason uh, because they're more complex. They've spent a lot of time. It can go so, either way. Yep. So I'm, I, I don't. So we have a motion. We don't have a second at this point. <laughs> you don't have any second on any motion? Oh, second. no. We have a second on Tim's motion, but we do not have but we do not have a second on Tim's motion to amend the motion. I'll second that. Okay. Do you want to say I, something about it? I guess I'm just thinking about the past few years. We had a flood. We had a pandemic. Like I could see circumstances where people can't finish a project and it could be a senior living facility. Like if that one hadn't gone through because of the flood, all of a sudden now we're going to keep the entire $28,000 fee. I don't know. I just could see scenarios. I think we could reassess this if like, I would want to know, does I'd feel comfortable doing this if I knew other communities, this is like standard practice. Um, if most places give it back, having a flat fee still seems fair to be like, we are doing work. Um, that's just the expectation. You know, that's, it's very clear up front. There's a set amount. Um, and I would be open to revisiting it in the future if we get information like, yeah, most communities just keep it all and there is no refund, then yeah. I could get on board with that. <laughs> so I just think, I mean, $500 buys a lot of project. Uh, it, I mean, it would be more than the fee for a small bathroom. Yes, yes. So it should be somehow up, up to, <laughs> but, I mean, you're not going to refund more than they paid, right? Of course, if it's a flat fee, it's got to be something that covers, you know, 99% of the projects. You what know. if it's $500 for commercial and $100 for residential or something like that? Just thinking of this. I think it needs to be something something like that. You know, what I'm thinking, Temple Drug emotions uh, and it seems like it really just go back and see what the staff feels good about it's really a relationship of staff with yeah. citizens and, and then maybe next time we can talk about it but really it's they're doing the interaction with people and have a sense of this but we don't do you want do you want to just not do this at this point yeah and so every, everybody votes no on this mo on, on this motion and on the uh, <laughs> 
because technically under Robert's rules, there's not really a way to withdraw a motion because once a motion is made, right, once a motion is made, it belongs to the body. It doesn't belong to the maker of the motion. So the first to to do what Tim is suggesting, what we would do is uh, vote yes or no on the motion to amend and then vote no on the uh, original motion. Also move to postpone indefinitely. Yeah. That's another. Can we do that once at this stage in the process? Yes. Okay. I'm not sure. Do you have to handle that in first? Do you have to handle it in in reverse order? Yeah, so we could do that first. You want to move to postpone indefinitely? As long as we remember when we come back what the other two motions were at first. <laughs> yeah, maybe we're let's 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 vote on Tim's motion. Tim's motion. Let's vote on Tim's motion to amend his motion. All those in favor signify by saying aye. All those opposed? Okay, now we're ready to move vote on Tim's original motion. All those in favor? Signify by saying aye. All those opposed? All right. There we are. So the fee, the fee thing can come to us another day, Mike. That's fine. And and is that it? Or is there one that other is, thing? Nope, that was it. So we want to So now it's ripe for a motion to adopt the as ordinance as amended. Who wants it's building code as amended. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. Anyone opposed? All right, roll call. It's okay. Uh, Donna. Aye. Perry. Aye. Sal. Aye. Tim. Aye. Palin. And uh, Palin voted aye, and Lauren, no. no. Okay, the motion carries. We've adopted the, the uh, ordinance. <laughs> Thank you for your patience. All right, we are on to, <laughs> yeah. I will. Um, Here I do this to you. No, it. I, I I really appreciate it. Every time you come in here with this stuff, you know what you're talking about, and it is very helpful uh, for us to go through it. Um, item 10, change the April council meeting dates. That's Kelly. It's been a quiet night for you, Kelly. Because of Mike and Sarah, you know, not much to see here. Um, so we are recommending that maybe we adjust the meeting schedule in um, April. I can't hear you. Oh, yep. Sorry, is that bad? that's way better, a lot louder. Oh my goodness. Um, so we're recommending that we um, amend the meeting schedule in April. Um, we have a scheduling conflict um, for the first meeting. I'm just actually pulling up our proposal right now, so I can get the dates specifically. Um, so here we are. So uh, what we're looking to do, council typically meets the second and fourth Wednesday. Um, this would be the 10th and the 24th. Um, the April 10th meeting conflicts with an ICMA Northeast Regional Conference. And the April 24th um, meeting conflicts with school vacation week. Um, we uh, don't necessarily have a conflict with the school vacation week, um, but we do with the first meeting. So if um, possible, we were hoping to maybe move both meetings up a week. So do the third and the 17th to eliminate possible conflicts. That work for everybody? That works for me and I am out of the town on the 24th. Or for school break, so yes, and you're <laughs> and you're not the only member with kids in school, so uh, it seems like that'd probably be a popular thing. Is that okay with everybody? All right, I'm sorry, and Palin, you're okay with that too. Great, Perfect. all right, thank you. Um, I don't see anything in any under other business. Uh, city council reports, starting with Lauren tonight. 
Yes. The only thing I was trying to get an update because the budget adjustment act has been moving. Um, so, and with bill out of town, I don't know if you had all of this Kelly, so I can just wait for you if so, but I did have her text me the numbers. I do not know. Oh, so great. If you'd oh. be willing to share them. That would be great. Okay. So what I got, uh, was that Montpelier will be getting $825,000 grant for the city for helping with the flood related costs and ERAF fully covered. So that's good. Um, unfortunately, no immediate funding for an individual mitigation, but that request is in for the budget, the fiscal year 25 budget. So again, this is the budget adjustment from the previous budget is that 825,000 and the ERAF. Um, and as well as some um, there's an ongoing request for additional money for municipal abatements and revenue replacement. Um, so we'll be, we'll keep fighting for more money, but there's 825,000 and the ERAF fully covered for now. Thanks. Uh, Palin? Nothing. Tim? Sal? No, nothing. Harry? Uh, I was talking about the upcoming eclipse earlier today with the city clerk and talking about um i had ordered some of those eclipse glasses and the city clerk let me know that the city apparently has thousands of them or is getting thousands of them or something that there may be some available for people and so i would love to hear more about that and let and if they're you know if that's something that's available to the public hear about that so that people can cancel their amazon orders for the special sunglasses like I did if they don't need them. Do you have the answer to that, John? Well, Montpelier Live has a whole bunch of, yeah, we're, we have a bunch in our office stack that we're giving out, so I'm not sure how many they have, but I, I know it's quite a bit, so. So uh, you think that. you're going to have them out like on uh, town meeting day for people I don't know. Um, I'll see if I can. Yeah, that would make a lot of sense. So if, some, if I can go grab you all some down there. We've, we've got some <laughs> at home. Uh, Donna. Thank you. Uh, this may be my last meeting. This is my third time I've been challenged in my five elections. And so they've all been difficult. <laughs> <laughs> but it's been great serving here, and uh, I haven't been on the council with all of you that long, uh, Lauren and Jack the longest, but it's been really interesting. It's always a delight when people just do their thing, and they study the material, and they come here and share all these different opinions and personalities. So thank you for serving the city and agreeing to disagree with me. <laughs> thank you. Mayor's report, I just want to let people know the annual report is out. Um, we've got uh, nice on the back. There's a nice picture of the uh, of the city council from one of our meetings at the uh, at the senior center. And it's full of information. Uh, if anyone's got some questions about how your city government works and you want to review that before uh, before you come out and vote next week. Um, it's here and online, and uh, I encourage everybody to come out and uh, and vote on or before uh, next Tuesday. City Clerk's report. A really great picture of us on the back cover. <laughs> it, it, it really came out pretty well. Yeah, so it's pretty good. <laughs> I just mentioned Saturday voting hours. Um, my office will be open from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. on Saturday for early voting. Uh, city manager's report. I don't have anything to report. Thank you. All right. Then that means we are adjourned at 10.59 p.m. We got out before 11 o'clock. <laughs>